Anne, how are you? How's hey, Zach, how are you? I am excellent. How are you? Wow, early. Good. Early today, early today. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, we, uh, we went for the dinner stuff. So I want to organize something like that in Washington. You know, I know if you uh, if you can rally the troops, you know, like a you know dinner and history, and we'll pick a restaurant. You know, we'll go and then I'll start the uh, group. And I don't know. I mean, it's a meetup is like international. I mean, it doesn't matter where you are. Right? Yeah, matter. right, right. But right. Uh, if we want to do outings, I mean, I could you know organize something like that and just come to Washington. We can go to. A, nice you know place we can discuss history and stuff like that but we'll see do you get down to washington much i've been there during COVID um last june yeah really yeah it was very nice uh, what were you doing down here do, visiting with fr uh, relatives so no uh, a friend of mine uh couldn't get a flight back to back home <laughs> and he <wanted> <laughs> You wanted to see uh, ah. cities, so I showed them, you know, I, I showed them, uh, you know, Washington, Philly, Boston, whatever I could get to. I mean, there was no hotel, so it's like a one-day trips, you know. Right. I mean, Washington was the most difficult one because you know it was so far, uh, but otherwise, the, nothing was opening up, so we were just traveling there. And uh, did you have friends that you stayed with, or did you stay at a hotel? There weren't any hotels open to stay at, were there? It was one day trips. We just went for one day and then came back at night. Okay, that's that's a that's a lot of driving though. That's five hours each way, isn't it? He was here. It's his second time in the United States, and you know he came pre-COVID. He decided to hang around a little bit. He had a visa for three months. You know, came to my house, and then you know, Lord behold, you know this thing hit, and he couldn't get the flight back to Russia. You know, so. You know, and then I actually he ended up going to L.A. and then he got a flight from L.A. to Russia, which is weird. You know. <laughs> and, and so this was like last summer. It was last summer. Well, he, he was he, he was here from March to June while I had to entertain him for three months. I was staying home anyway. So, you know, we traveled, you know, went to Florida. How long was he supposed to be here for? Um, so he was supposed to be here until... January of 2020 because the visa they give you a visa for like ah uh, okay one year and so you visit all his relatives and and they kind of kind kind kindly told him like he's a really good friend of mine when I went to Russia I was with hanging out with him I, I mean be, behold I was only for there for two weeks but uh, obviously I couldn't leave him you know he showed me St. Petersburg Moscow, you know, and he's well to do guy and but he just couldn't get a flight, you know. No, of course not. Now, so Russia was okay taking him back in the middle of COVID because he's a Russian citizen. Russian citizen, yeah. Russia did well with their citizens, but if you were a citizen of Uzbekistan, I had some friends that were stranded in Thailand for one year. <laughs> in Thailand. And so because Uzbekistan wouldn't let people back in. Well, they, yeah, they didn't care. They didn't yeah, care. Uh, yeah. Care. I had a friend who uh, who spends about half his time in Houston and half his time in Tokyo. He has an apartment there, but he was here in the states when COVID hit, and he still hasn't been able to get back to Tokyo. Um, you know, the Japanese are really tight about letting people in. Um, I'm sure it's loosening up now considerably, but. Uh, but yeah, people just got stuck. So was he actually staying with you or was he, did he have a place to stay? So he's a, he's a religious Jewish guy. Mm -hmm. he stayed, uh, sometimes he stayed with a really this religious couple that like kept everything. I'm not very religious, but I tried to be for him. You know, I'm Jewish. <laughs> so I, when he came in here, you know, it was quite a, inconvenience i had to do things you know a certain way and you, you know and i don't have two sinks like he likes you know but there <laughs> you know, a mansion back in 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 russia and i don't have a mansion <laughs> so, but it was difficult uh, but uh well good for you it was an experience 
it was an experience. He's a really good guy. He's a really good guy. You know, good, good friend with my cousin in Israel. And you know what? It, it made us even more closer that way. Oh, I bet it did. If you didn't end up killing each other, you must have been closer. <laughs> he, he's an interesting dude. I mean, the guy is, you know, he made his money during that uh, 90s, you know, Russia. Oh, came. God. Ask no questions, right? Ask me no questions, I'll tell you no lies. <laughs> I, exactly, I asked no questions, and uh, so, so yeah, the nineties were wild. I mean, um, in Russia, because you know everything was being privatized, quote privatized, quote, and you know Yeltsin had no control whatsoever of what was going on, and so it was just a free for all. He said that one dude in ninety two approached him to buy a nine-story building for like half a million dollars. Oh, I believe it. I totally believe it. Center of... It was... And it wasn't just nine-story building and like several sections. It's nine or ten sections. So it's like, I don't know how many residential apartments there. Easily over 120 or so like that. I totally... I totally... Yeah. I totally believe it. I mean, I'm sure the whole real estate situation was crazy because all the state owned stuff was sort of up for grabs. And in terms of ownership records and all that kind of stuff, and anybody that had cash, I'm sure some um, former operachnik was more than happy to make sure the transaction happened, yeah, you know, for ten or $15,000. Yeah, you bought blocks of apartments in Kiev. He bought blocks of apartments in Moscow. I mean, he he's bought he's he's done really well for himself. You know, he bought uh, stocks of Russian companies that nobody wanted, and now we know all of them. You know, Gazprom and <laughs> yeah, <Russia>. yeah. <laughs> and then he's the only one who believed in it. You know, all the all the Jews were leaving, like leave this behind. I was like, no, I'm staying. I, I'm gonna make money, and he did. You know, God bless. Good for him. But yeah, still, for sure. He still couldn't get a plane back. Yeah. <laughs> I was joking with you. All the money, you're like uh, Escobar, you know, like yeah. you all this money. You couldn't buy a waffle bread. A, <laughs> and he was laughing his ass off. Man. It was like, I know I'm useless. Like, you're useless. I said. <laughs> you know, that's funny. I was just reading today. I didn't realize Barney uh, uh, made off. Uh, died uh, back in April. I didn't realize that. Oh yeah, I, I mean, Bernie. They, they didn't want to make him, you know, uh, make a big deal out of him because of what he did, you know. Uh, so. Well, there you go. All his money, and he died in jail, disgraced. Although you know, his wife is not doing badly. Well, you know, his wife has got a place out in the Hamptons. Yeah, but you know what? Uh, the curse had had happened. One son. Oh yeah, very sad. But one son died of cancer. God forbid. I mean, his grandkids are being mocked in the streets and schools, and he's he was a very prominent, you know, Jewish member of Jewish community, and he his whole family been ostracized. Well, most of his clients who end up, ended up with getting built uh, were Jewish. You know, that was kind of how he operated in those, you know, affluent Long Island communities. Um, yeah, so, is. yeah, there was there was a lot of although, you know what the truth is, after all the suits and, you know, making all the insurance companies that had insured them and all of that kind of, without getting adequate and all the lawsuits and all that sort of thing. All those people ended up pretty well. They got their money back and then some. But it took years, years and years and years of litigation. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. I, I, I used to work for a big four and, uh, and we were on Lehman bankruptcy when I was working for Deloitte and they were hiring us as trustee. Let me tell you, those firms were going out of business daily and we didn't disperse in the United States a dime until all the lawsuits were, you know, were settled. In England, they had no issues. It was like, oh, you're going out of business. Let, here's your money back. You know, all this Lehman money that were, we stranded it until everything was reconciled to a penny. And then, you know, 50 million companies went out of business. And now, okay, here's your money. What's the difference? They don't care. Yeah, yeah. what's the difference at that point? We operate here. Everything is so 
segmented, regimented, is customers money protected? It was like, oh, yeah. it was disgusting. And, uh, you know, nobody cares about anybody. I mean, you know, I mean, mind you, Lehman was the biggest bankruptcy in the world, but uh, it is what it is. People That's still a strange story. The full truth about all of that is yet to come out, I think. There's been a lot of books written uh, and all of that, but I think there's still more to be told. You know, why Lehman? Why that day? Why everything? You know, um, it was like, was, yeah, the perfect storm, but wow. There was a joke about Bear Stearns that survived depression and two world wars and couldn't su survive subprime. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Two world wars and depression and couldn't survive subprime. How could, because people get greedy. They, you know, he was very conservative. Bear Stearns were the most conservative shop out there. They wouldn't put a dime in something that didn't make sense. All of a sudden they were buying it like there's no tomorrow. And that's what happens. Ingredient. All about transaction fees, right? They, it was a madness where we don't really care what we're transacting just so we get the transaction fees. And plenty of people made plenty of money and walked away A-OK, -okay, uh, including Goldman Sachs, for example. Oh, but um, on the other side of this whole thing and, you know, AIG got bailed out and they yeah. showed everybody. <laughs> it was the biggest joke. I mean, the, the, you know, like the, the whole thing blew, blew, blew out of, you know, blew out of the water. In 80, 90 years, there was no issues. I mean, what the hell? <laughs> I mean, no, it's, a, it's strange. Something, something very strange went on there. And like I said, we still don't know the truth. It'll probably be a while before we know more of the truth. And we'll probably never know all of the truth. But layman, I always heard that, you know, certainly layman was in trouble when everything started to melt down, but that it was really the uh, the Chinese, it was a Chinese loan that they had for their overnight liquidity loan. Right. And they're, the Chinese are the ones that informed them, we're not gonna renew, we're not gonna roll over your overnight liquidity loan in the next 24 hours. And it was like, we're out of business. <laughs> that's, that's, that's how it is. I remember uh, my geography teacher in Uzbekistan was telling me if there was an, you know, uh, archaeologist or let's say an engineer, whoever it is, uh, try to discover a city in former Soviet Union. And initially he would say there's oil next to the city, there's water supplies and all that stuff. And then in about a year, things run out. He's going to be put in front of the firing squad and get shot. You know, <laughs> here, <laughs> Madoff had stolen trillions of dollars and we were feeding him in the prison. <laughs> what the hell, you know? Like where, where is, you know, <laughs> they say, you know, it, it's just, it's not fair. I mean, but I think some of it, they need a firing squad. Blue collar, I mean, white collar, doesn't matter what crime. You, you <laughs> well, hopefully, hopefully not exact for, for financial for, for, for financial crimes. I can't quite go that far. <laughs> yeah, you know, he, his son hang himself, but that's only his family. How many other people that hang themselves and kill themselves in depression and not? Oh, it's 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 uh, it's no joke for sure. Um, but yeah, that Madoff story is a fun story too. I think he was somewhat mixed up with the mob too. You know, some of his employees were, were former wise guys. Um, not the high, not the, not the suits, but the back office ones that were rolling all those fake books because they knew how to do it. He hired them because they knew how to do it. Or were they mob types? I was really, I, I recently read the smartest guys in the room all about Enron. Um, when they went for Andrew Fasto, when they hired, when they looked at Andrew Fasto as their chief financial officer, they were told this guy, th this guy doesn't play by the rules. Or I forgot how they phrased it. Um, they, 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 they emphasized that he, basically they emphasized that he didn't play by the rules. And they said, uh, and they said, great, that's what we need. 
<laughs> well, of course, yeah, they can always call it thinking outside of the box and yeah. all of that I kind of, they, they can always package it up as something I, nice. I, I, sorry, I remember the term now that said he lacked a moral compass. And it's like, that's not good. That's our man. They hired him. And of course, of course, when, when, when everything went bad, he, he ratted on them. And, so uh, they kind of got what they deserve. Yeah, let me welcome some people. Hmm. Uh, Howard, hi. Uh, Ralph, hi. Greg, Beverly, how are you? I can see she's playing with her uh, uh, Judy. How are hi. You? She's back. How are you, Judy? I'm here. <laughs> I'm so glad. Um, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Uh, Thank you. Tell me about it. You know, we had a first successful uh, restaurant outing, and uh, hopefully, next one we're going to do in. Um, you know, a restaurant and Uzbeki food, if anybody interested, I'll post it somewhere next month or so uh, in New York. <laughs> so, but at some point, we'll do something closer to Anne's house. Uh, <laughs> in DC. In DC, yeah. And then, you know, we'll, Greg will definitely make a trip with me and maybe some other people, you know, mm -hmm. Ralph, Paul, we'll, you know, we'll go all hire a bus and uh, we'll hit his, you know, history. We'll just, on the way, four or five hours, we'll just discuss history, that's all. America, after my America Cup presentation, I expect you all to sail down. Oh, yeah. Greg ought to be able to handle that, judging by his questions. Yeah, Greg, well. Greg, Greg is still building his Indian canoe. With, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That'll work. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a long trip. I, I don't know if I could make it in one day. <laughs> I yeah, mean, no, I've, I've sailed from uh, Annapolis up to Newport. Um, you know, it depends a lot on the weather, uh, obviously. Um, but yeah, that would be a long trip for one day. It would probably be at least two days stop in Cape yeah. May overnight and then come down to Delaware and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And my dream also to go to some wine country. But uh, we will. We'll, uh, you know, freeze it for now. <laughs> Do you have wine country up around New York? We we have some wineries here in in Virginia. Um, you know, uh, I mean, Virginia would be nice, but uh, I was thinking even flying to L.A. We have one of our Lisa is from, from L.A. You know, do the hitching post and stuff. No, no good wineries on the East Coast. <laughs> That's probably true. You know, we can Ontario go wineries are doing very well in, on the Niagara Peninsula. What's it like on the Buffalo side? Buffalo? I've never heard of it. Hmm? Uh, Buffalo sure. wine? What's that? Did you, are you saying there's wine wineries around Buffalo? Yeah, I'm saying, yeah there are on the Canadian there side. On, wow. On the Niagara side, they, uh, what they call, we call the Niagara Peninsula, there's wineries all over the place. Wow! Oh, wow! I didn't. Know that. But again, it's it's not the high quality. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they they, they claim win wine contests. Mikhail yeah. had drank uh, two, you know, paradigms paradigms of uh, wines: Russian wine and American wine. And now he's not giving it, you know, giving it that. He's not lowering standards anymore. <laughs> I, know, I know I know a gentleman from Paris, France, and he goes down to Niagara Frontier and he buys buys ice wine and ships that home. Ice well, wine? Yeah. Wine is a separate thing. Yeah, it's a, oh, it's nice a wine. A ice wine. I C E. Uh, yeah. I actually <laughs> thought the last time uh, French, uh, you know, the, the, the ship, the wines were shipped to France was Etruscans. Like I was wrong, I guess. <laughs> hmm? They're sending it from Buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, on the, Buffalo's on the other side of the river. They, the condition has to be similar. French are very particular about their wine. They don't want anybody. Yeah, infringing on you know. Mm -hmm. All right, and uh, we got ten people on. You want to give it a couple more minutes? Whatever you want to do. Sure. Why don't we uh, give it maybe one more minute, and then we can go ahead and get rolling. Yeah. So we had a uh, good Persian food. It was really good. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, by the way, I just wanted to remind this week uh, on Sunday. At uh, I moved the meeting to five instead of four. Just make sure, you know, when you get at four, 
unless you want to wait for an hour, but it's at mm -hmm. five and it's going to be uh, Sergio presenting uh, mm. another presentation coming to America. Uh, and next week, uh, we have a couple of presentations as well. Um, so Conquest of Americas is this Sunday. And next Saturday, we're talking about First Kings. It would be a combination of uh, Paul and Greg. Uh, you know, uh, and then on Sunday next week, we're going to talk about Volga Bulgars. I'm trying to get Mohammed to present. He's actually a very known um, uh, Muslim scholar, but um, maybe he'll come in as a guest, but I'll be presenting. If anybody familiar with Volga Bulgars, they predate and therefore, you know, not related particularly to Bulgaria, but that's, that's, that's the gist of it, basically. They're somehow related, but not really. Um, I'm sorry, Zach, what did you say before that? You said that um, Paul and Greg are presenting what day? First King, uh, Roman Republic, uh, on mm -hmm. Saturday 12th at 12. Okay, okay, thank 12th you. 12. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that would, you know, and then, and then we have another one on, on the following Sunday on 20th would be interesting one. It's me and uh, uh, Ava presenting libraries of uh, Ashur, Ashurbanipal, Assyria and Alexandria. So we're gonna talk about preservation or dying of those or being burnt <laughs> libraries. We're gonna talk about that a little bit tonight, Zach. Oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, so just a little bit. Of course, I'm covering like, um, 2300 years so everything is going to be just a little bit but at any rate how about we get started if everybody's ready yeah 11 people on yes go ahead okay great let me uh share screen yes ma'am and uh i should say like i always say sometimes my malware uh kicks me off but i always come back within a few minutes or seconds even so don't worry if that happens. We also have a big uh, thunderstorm rotating through here, so we will see. Well, at any rate, um, the topic I suggested and Zach kindly uh, agreed to give me some time to present about is a, a question that I know I've always had, which is how did Aristotle get from like the 300 BC to how well we know them, what, what was that journey? And so often I've heard um, the trope that, uh, you know, he was somehow kind of discovered, rediscovered by the Renaissance. Uh, but I'm not sure that that trope is quite true. So perhaps we'll, we'll see how this transpired as we go ahead. So basically, how did Aristotle get from then? And this of course is the famous painting by Raphael, uh, in the Vatican, which has all the, called School of Athens, uh, right there. How did he get from then to now, where, you know, we have our own views of him and he's, you know, extremely well known and, and well versed? Well, the answer, like a lot of things in that regard, is it's complicated how he got from then to now. Uh, with a lot of twists and turns. And please, I always like to throw in a caveat to please remember that I'm just a Googler. I'm not a scholar, like some of the, uh, and many of you all probably know as much or more about some of the things I'm gonna cover. So please jump in where I've gotten something wrong or you've got additional information that would be uh, interesting to everyone. But anyway, I thought the first thing I'd do is to go over a couple of the reasons why it's complicated, why we can't just draw a straight line from birth of Aristotle and here's where we are today. Here's how we know of him today. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the issues is, of course, we're not exactly sure what Aristotle's original works were. Did he write things? Were they notes taken by his students? Were they notes that his students made and then he edited? Um, that's, that's really 
it's uh, still an, uh, it's it's probably an unknowable kind of topic. We certainly know that the works that we call the works of Aristotle came from the mind of someone named Aristotle, but the actual written work um, we we just don't know because as we see we'll see we don't have any of the original written work um, and. By the way, often in, in discussions I found in going through this topic, when people are talking about Aristotle's works, they make a uh, distinction between esoteric and exoteric words. And in English, that's a little, that's a little um, uh, distracting because when we think of esoteric, we think of uh, secret things, magical things, things of that nature, usually when one talks about esoteric knowledge. But in point of fact, what, what scholars, Aristotelian scholars are talking about is at, what this word acroamatic work versus exoteric work. And uh, acro, acroamatic, I can't entirely say it, just means told only to chosen disciples only. So those notes that students may have taken who students and colleagues who sat in on Arist Aristotle's lectures at the Lyceum, that those notes are con considered esoteric or acromatic material. Apparently the majority of what was Aristotle's written works what got committed to writing were these acromatic works, these notes, as opposed to exoteric word works, which were prepared specifically for public distribution. Apparently, Aristotle did very few of those, and all of those are lost. We only know them by sort of glancing references. So there's the issue of what exactly were the, the writings of Aristotle. Uh, there's the issue of copies and translations over 2,000 years. As we all know, there's the telephone game where you start off with something and it goes through enough hands and it ends up something entirely different. Um, I don't know, I think Ben, in this little example here, Benedict Cumberbatch, I gather, is, a, is an Australian actor. <laughs> But through a, it doesn't take much to turn around his name. And, and the same is probably true when we're talking about ancient manuscripts. In the course of being copied, in the course of being translated, changes got made. I mean, anybody that's looked into, obviously, how the Bible, the current Bible, was compiled over the millennia knows that that's an entire world of academic research is what copies were accurate and which co which translations were accurate, what inaccuracies were introduced that have to be extirpated. Uh, another complication of the Aristotle story is the geographic distribution of his works after his time. And we'll see a little bit in detail of that story, you know, what of Aristotle's works went where, when, when did they go, and by whom were they taken uh, after Aristotle died and the demise of the uh, Lyceum in Athens. Um, I should also mention that a big player in that, at least initially, is probably his famous student Aristotle, um, Aristotle Alexander. Um, because even if Alexander didn't actually physically distribute copies of works at that point that Aristotle may have generated, I, I think it's probable that he spread the name of Aristotle around as he went through his various campaigns. Um, because it, it looks like, as we will go through this, we'll see, it looks like Aristotle was kind of a superstar from the beginning. Um, it wasn't as though he did his writings in his own little scholarly nook, and then it took a while for people to recognize how great it was, and then he got very popular. He was, re he was renowned from even during his lifetime. 
First, because I think his association with Plato, and then of course his association with Alexander. So the works of Aristotle were in demand from the from the very inception of of their you know what happened to them after Aristotle passed on. But as they got spread around. There's complications there. The works, you know, various versions of the works, various parts and pieces of the works. Um, another complication to how, you know, how things got transmitted down to us, up to us, however you want to put it, it was, of course, just natural deterioration and loss. Um, as I mentioned, there's references, there's indications that that Aristotle had an entire series of uh, exoteric works, finished works that he, we would consider them like articles or essays nowadays, as opposed to these notes of his lectures. Those are completely gone. Um, they were probably written down, but in the course of empire, uh, they've either, either just, they've just disappeared. Um, so that, that always complicates knowing what did an ancient author actually produce? What was the full body of his, his work? Anne? Yes, ma'am. Um, I, I, I thought that there was very clear, or that's what I understood, that the, their, his students wrote the notes and that they recognized uh, Aristotle by his system, the system of... Um, explaining things was very, very characteristic of him. So that's why they, there was no question that this was Aristotelian words because the system that he implied was very, and he wrote uh, very clearly and it was kind of boring, but um, I, I thought that that was kind of not a question. Like Plato's was, um, writing for um, Socrates, but uh, maybe he put some words in Socrates that they were not Socrates, but with Aristotle it was very clear that it was his students and was um, kind of definitely his work because it was very, very, um, the system was very organized and very clear from the beginning. That's what I thought. Well, uh, you know, um, that's, I think that's accurate. Uh, however, we don't know uh, whether what has come down to us was indeed written by a student and Aristotle never looked at it or whether it was written by a student and then the student and Aristotle sat down and there was kind of a, a final edited version of the material. Um, that we, we don't know. Um, so we don't know who actually composed the written works. And I think that's probably unknowable at this stage of the game. Were they notes of Aristotelian lectures? That I think you're right for all the reasons that you just described, that there is a, there's a, there's a consensus. And we'll see a little bit more that there was a thing known as Aristotle's library. <laughs> it has its own fascinating story. Can I ask um, a question, Anne? Yeah, yeah, please. So, um, I'm more of an, I, you know, my interest has always been Plato's dialogues, so it's more flowing. And I've always thought that the dialogue is a much better way of engaging. And I've asked people this, and they mentioned that Aristotle had dialogues too. And he wrote dialogues, apparently, he wrote dialogues that were very beautiful, good characters, and like you can split things too. And that what we got like in the Kamakian ethics or metaphysics are the lecture notes. I don't know if you've heard of that, that the dialogues of Aristotle are lost, but he was very poetic or he was, he developed like the dialogues the same way Plato did and he used tools like, you know, characters like Glaucon in the Republic of like this. Aristotle would have had the same kind of dialogue. Well, as I said, there are these esoteric works, which, which are called, which were the notes. And then there is, there is, talk that there were these exoteric works. For example, Plato's di dialogues would be considered exoteric. They were what written- What does that word mean, esoteric and exoteric? What do these words mean? Uh, e esoteric means it was, only, it was material information, knowledge that was shared among a group, a, 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 a select group of people. 
verbally and then possibly written down. So it was, it was done in private, so to speak. Exoteric works means it was something that was written to be published, you know, as a finished piece of work. Plato's dialogues are like that. They're obviously not notes. They're something somebody wrote and polished. It was intended to be publicly disseminated. There are rumors apparently, you know, in all the various other commentators, et cetera, that were contemporary, more closer in time to Aristotle, that he did have a body of this exoteric work, which would be something like polished dialogues, but those are all completely lost. All we have are these esoteric kind of works, which have very much of the appearance of being just notes of some sort, as opposed to an actual written, written pieces of work. So, okay, it's, it's, it, is, it is a little confusing. Um, but at any rate, another complication, you know, that, that, that makes following the thread of what was Aristotle's body of work is that there were many compilations where somebody would sit down at various points and say, I'm going to look over all the information out there about Aristotle's works, and I'm going to compile a definitive collection. And uh, these things have been, these have been done over the years and what, what is included in the collection gets dropped out and gets dropped back in. So, you know, we've had variations on what was the definitive list of Aristotle's works and that's changed over the years. Um, uh, you know, we had the medieval period. So, you know, there, that was an entire era of even more copies and translations and com com commentaries and compilations, all, all contending as being, this is the body of Aristotle's work. And uh, each individual work having its own kind of history. Um, and last but not least, uh, in this kind of thread, we've had modern scholarship. And modern scholarship has taken a lot of, of all these ancient sources and done its own kind of magic in terms of coming up with these nice little neat sets of books. Here is the body of Aristotle's works. <laughs> so in any event, there's a lot of twists and turns to the story of how Aristotle got from then to now in these nice books. And, and that's what we're gonna talk about a little bit. So generally, I'm gonna go over a little, little bit about who was Aristotle. I'm sure most of you all know his personal story. Then I'm gonna talk about the story for the about 300 years following Aristotle, uh, in which there is a story about his personal library and where that went to in various places uh, among, in and out of the hands of various owners of that material. Uh, then I'm gonna talk a little bit about all the catalogers, the people who cataloged uh, Aristotle's works, trans, some of the more famous translators. How did it get from Greek to Latin or Greek to Arabic? Um, the big split between the East and the West about the attitude towards Aristotle and Aristotle's work. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about the medieval reconfluence when we had people like Thomas Aquinas uh, rediscovering, so to speak, uh, the breadth of Aristotle uh, via uh, various um, Arabic sources like Averroes and Jewish sources, Maimonides. Then I'll talk a little bit about the famous Renaissance in Aristotle when supposedly Aristotle was rediscovered and that, that with the rediscovery of Plato triggered the Renaissance, which I think is a, is a story that's probably more fiction than fact. Then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the German Aristotle, which is uh, one of the the major compilations of his definitive catalogs of his work, which we still rely on today. And then a little bit about 
the very modern, what's going on contemporaneously. So at any rate, the Aristotle, uh, we've all seen all the busts of him. I love this map on the left. I, <laughs> I didn't really need the map, but it was such a great map. He grew up in a, all the places he lived were very beautiful places all around Greece. He was a lucky man in that regard. Um, this is a portrait, a, a bust of Aristotle that was based on an ancient Greek marble sculpture, which was uh, a copy made in a, a hundred, you know, 100 AD or common, common era. So several hundred years after Aristotle lived, but it was a copy based on one by a famous Greek um, sculptor by the name of Lysippus. Uh, which was done much earlier. And I think partially goes to the fact, again, that Aristotle was a superstar somehow from the very beginning. Um, and, and that's remarkable because he's maintained that superstardom for over 2000 years. If anything, he's more of a superstar now. I think there's, there's very few people in the entire world that if you said the word Aristotle, wouldn't have that wouldn't ring some bell with them as sort of a brainy philosopher of some sort and that's a remarkable remarkable sort of charism to have uh so at any rate i always like this this particular uh sculpture of his of course what we know about aristotle uh is a puzzle it's a it's a putting together a puzzle from a lot of sources sources that were close to him in time and sources that were farther away from him at times, but people who claim to come up with uh, new information. But we do have a lot of information about him. There's, I mean, from very earliest, uh, very, very earliest times, his immediate uh, people that came along immediately afterwards were writing lives of Aristotle. Um, and this is, this is just a few of them. Um, you know, all these various Vita Aristoteluses of them, which people over time take a piece from here, a piece from there. This piece is deemed reliable because it's repeated in three other different pieces, etc. And the picture that emerges is that uh, basically he was born in 384 BC in Stigera and up in, and I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, and anyone who knows better pronunciation of these words, please cut in, uh, in the, in, up in the Macedonian Peninsula. He was the son of Nicomaeus and Phaestus. Nicomaeus was supposedly a fairly renowned physician um, of, of, of a sort known in, and, and, uh, in Macedonia. His mother was from Chalcis or Chalcis, uh, which is closer down to Athens. Um, they both died early and uh, he, at the age of 17, was sent to study at Athens to the famous Plato's Academy. Um, I'm sure can he... I, can I yeah. ask uh, something? Of Please. The, uh, uh, whatever the pronunciation is, Tajira, in the uh, Chalcidis, um, uh, or Chalcidis, uh, uh, there are three peninsulas there that, that's famous. It was not a Macedonian territory. It was also taken by Philip later on, not, not at the time when he was born and grew up. Uh, he, um, um, uh, you know, it was still uh, kind of independent Greek city. Uh, okay. Uh, and uh, uh, one little detail, However, because of the proximity, uh, he, uh, his, uh, his father was a physician and he was physician at the court of uh, uh, Philip's, uh, Philip II's father, um, that's his name, uh, and actually uh, grew up uh, with uh, Philip. He, they, they knew each other as teenagers uh, before. And then from there, he went to study. Uh, so he went to Athens when he was 17. Just a little. No, no, and that's that's um, that's absolutely all. That's interesting, and um, that's, that's one of the reasons Philip felt comfortable inviting him because he knew him. Uh, uh, they were uh, uh, close by age, and he knew him uh, uh, in in uh, adolescence, and that's why he uh, felt that uh, he invited him uh, to 
the future of the Sama Center. Right. It, that makes sense. And uh, the other thing, too, is I think two points. He was obviously very bright. Um, uh, and from, from as he was growing up, and he was also from a fairly prosperous family. Um, you know, unlike uh, Socrates, who claimed to be from sort of working class background, uh, uh, Aristotle traveled in aristocratic circles from, from the beginning, and they must have been people who were well connected. And it's kind of like getting your, getting your kid into Harvard. They knew where to get, where to send him when the time came, and they got him into Plato's Academy. And of course, he was obviously more than well qualified to be sent then. Um, so in any event, uh, he was at Plato's Academy where he remained for 20 years. Now, how much of his work was generated while he was at the Academy and how much was generated later? Again, uh, there's no real, real track record in that regard. Um, at 37, uh, he, uh, after Plato had died, uh, he spent a few years kind of traveling through Asia Minor and particularly uh, around the area of uh, Mytilene, Mytilene. Um, and the story goes, and remember, these are stories that come from all those vitae that we just saw. So some may be true, some may be not true. That, but in Mytilene, and, and, and yeah. Mytilene, this is the uh, capital of the Lesbos, island of Lesbos. Correct. Yeah, okay. I, I and, think you said in Asia Minor. Well, I mean, it wasn't on the mainland of Greece. But yeah, that's the island of Lesbos. Um, I meant on the Asia, Asia Minor side, side of the, okay. uh, the sea there. Um, in any event, he, uh, a lot of, uh, some of his uh, scientific works, uh, people have been able to identify that uh, some of the species, etc., that he describes and refers to were actually from that region. Um, uh, and any event, after a few years of sort of wandering around, uh, not in a, in a very directed way, but uh, in areas that he had not Bet, spend a lot of time before he is, as as Greg said, called by King Philip to become the mentor of Alexander the Great, who at that time, again, according to various chronologies, was somewhere in the neighborhood of 13 to 15 years old. Um, and, you know, again, he, uh, Aristotle further pursued these biological studies, which formed the basis of his writings about natural philosophy about nature um, and Troad, Assos, Atarnus, which is Greg sits on Lesbos and, in, and of course around the rim of Macedonia. Um, then after about five years or so, uh, once Alexander assumed the Mas that Macedonian throne and then commences his campaigns, um, Aristotle returned to Mytilene uh, to live for two years with his friend and the man who subsequently became his successor at the Lyceum, Theophrastus. And I point that out because Theophrastus uh, plays a, a prominent role in the first generation of, of being the steward of Aristotle's works. Um, then at 49, Aristotle returns to Athens, and when he returned to Athens, he did not go to Plato's Academy because that was a whole different crowd by that time, but he founded his own free philosophical school, which was uh, referred to as the Peripatetics, um, at a place in Athens known as the Lyceum. Uh, he taught there for 10 or 11 years, and this is where it is presumed he was giving the lectures, the notes of which were taken and comprise what is the body of Aristotle's work. Um, at 61, he had to leave Athens uh, because basically uh, there, was, was, there was a change in political climate. 
one of the many changes of political climate in Athens, excuse me, and it was a time the new crowd were not favorable to whatever Aristotle was espousing, his own political views at that point. And so he moved to Chalcis, which I showed the, the map down at the bottom, which is not, not a huge move for him. And remember, the story is that his mother was from Chalcis. So a, a lot of the narratives tend to say, you know, Aristotle was exiled from <laughs> Athens. Well, it may, it may have been kind of, I, I compare it to the exile as between Democrats and Republicans here around Washington. Um, you know, if you're a Democrat and a Republican regime comes in, a lot of these high level political appointees, they don't go home, they're exiled out to Bethesda <laughs> to basically live there and to come out again another day when a, another Democratic regime resumes. So he was basically going back to a place where he had property apparently uh, that he had inherited from his mother. And uh, however, he died within a year. And um, unlike Socrates, it was, it's generally, although there are some of that stories out there, it was, was not a self-harm kind of death. It, uh, he died of some sort of stomach problem. So, you know, don't know what precisely. So he died when he was 62 years old. So in the course of his life, Aristotle was a prosperous man. He was a renowned man. Um, and so that goes a lot, I think, to have contributing towards the immediate preservation of his work, uh, which might otherwise have just been left to, to fable as to what that work was comprised of. Uh, one thing that everyone agrees on, interestingly upon, is, is that Aristotle left a will. It's quite a detailed will. It looks very much like a modern will. Um, and uh, it's the content of it. We don't have the actual will, uh, but the content has come down to us. And uh, a lot of what we know about his personal life, at least in his adult years, comes from that will in that he goes through and makes very specific provisions for a lot of people in his life. And from the will, um, we learn that he had, he was living with a woman by the name of Herpilus. He was not her, his wife, his first wife had been named Pythias and she had died. She, he had a daughter by his first wife who was also named Pythias. And he had a son by his, we would call her, her his mistress, Herpilus, by the name of Nicomachus. Nicomachus uh, died as a, I believe, as a young adult. There's some speculation that the Nicomachean ethics were somehow associated with his name, but that's probably apocryphal. Pythias, his daughter, um, whom he provided for, as I said, he was a prosperous man. He had property in Macedonia. He had property in Chalcis, um, if I'm pronouncing that Chalcis word right. Um, and she married three times. Um, and uh, so this was, this was a man that was in the mainstream of his own society at that time. Uh, this is the tomb of Aristotle in Chalcis which was unearthed in uh, the 18th century, however, a uh, 19th century rather. Uh, however, now more, more recently, uh, there's been a discovery. I love it because it reported in that renowned archeological scholarly journal, the Daily Mail. Uh, they found, a, there's someone who's found a site in Macedon, um, Macedonia rather, uh, at Stigera. Stagora, whatever the name is, but he, it's now, it's buried under some Byzantine church remains. And I, I love when they interviewed, they, they asked him and his, about how he knew, he felt, why he felt that was Aristotle's burial place that he had found. His response was, I have no hard proof, but strong indications lead me to almost certainty. So <laughs> I I don't know if Aristotle himself would have accepted that assertion as sufficient, but um, the Daily Mail did. If he is buried there, obviously you can see by the photo, it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful spot. So uh, I hope he is. Um, 
At any rate, following his death, we go into the story of his library. Um, now, I mentioned that when he came back after tutoring, being uh, Alexander the Great's tutor, uh, he started his own school, uh, his own group, so to speak, where he he gave le to whom he gave lectures, uh, and this was came to be denominated as to be called the Peripatetic School, which means that in this garden derives from the story that in this garden where the Lyceum building was uh, located. Uh, Aristotle and his students, his colleagues, would walk and talk, basically. Um, that, that, so the peripatetic, and this, this is a picture from that uh, Raphael School of Athens. Of course, it's the two central figures. Uh, it's interesting that Raphael depicted them as looking like they're walking. Um, on the left is uh, uh, Plato, and on the right, is uh, Aristotle, and uh, they're in dialogue, and presumably that indicates Plato's pointing to his to his kind of ethereal forms in the ether, whereas Aristotle uh, is more point uh, gesturing towards the ground, towards reality. But in any event, uh, the Peripatetic School was this circle of philosophers, and they're there came to be a series of these peripatetic philosophers who, who, were, who worked, were, worked and conversed with Aristotle while he was alive and then carried on his and supplemented his body of work after he died. Um, geographically, the school was located in an area of Athens, uh, which was generally called the Lyceum. It was kind of a public space in a garden outside the, what were then the technical city walls of Athens. Um, uh, although Athens was, as it says, an easy walking distance. Um, a gymnasium had already been built there, so it was already a gathering place for affluent young Athenian men. Um, and it was also a place where visiting, you know, the famous sophists lectured there who came and went. Um, and again, it was called the peripatetic because there were walks in which these, you know, they walk and discuss things. Um, this is a picture, uh, obviously a contemporary Google map capture, uh, which shows you generally where Aristotle's Lyceum was this Lyceum was located. Again, he was, that was his 10 years that he was working after he came back to Athens from being um, Alexander's tutor. Uh, this just is to show you it's where it is in relation to the Acropolis and Plato's Academy, which is sort of in a different direction, different part of town, so to speak. Um, they do believe they located it and they are in the process of uh, archaeologically retrieving it. Um, interesting, so when you when there are references made to the peripatetic school, which is what's known as Aristotle's school, basically, it's, it's as much a reference to a group of people as it is to an actual building. Um, and it's interesting to note, Aristotle was not an Athenian citizen. And so he technically, he was something called a metic, um, and that was his, you know, status in the civic society. He could not technically own property in a Athens, and so his friend Theophrastus, uh, who you may recall he had met in Mytilene uh, when he was sort of in the in between period, one of the in between periods of his life, as between being at Plato's Academy, being with Alexander, and then returning to um, Athens again to form his own school. Um, down, uh, down there in the lower right hand corner, there's a, a that's a screen capture from a YouTube video there is up there. I kind of gave the link. Um, uh, that's a, I'm sure maybe a fanciful repre representation of what the the Lyceum building may have looked like. So it's it's in a setting like this where the young men would have been sitting around benches in that circle and, and Aristotle 
giving his lectures. And apparently there was, you know, it was a defined curriculum of lectures. He gave certain kind of lectures in the morning and other kind of lectures in the afternoon. Um, the morning ones apparently were the more sort of technical philosophical kind of lectures. Uh, whereas the ones in the afternoon were more about um, ethical matters that uh, young men attending would be, you know, how to lead an upstanding life and things of that nature. Um, so that brings us to what I call the travels of Aristotle's library. Now, what was Aristotle's library? Well, apparently, you know, in the course of his life, like, like all of us to some extent, he had accumulated a significant library and a library would have been scrolls, I guess, uh, at that stage of the game uh, of, of other ancient authors and also a library of these quote esoteric works, uh, the library of the notes of his lecture. Um, now, before he left Athens that final year, he left his library, he expressly left his library to, um, uh, I'm going to go come back to that, to, to his colleague Theophrastus. Uh, and Theophrastus became the next head of the peripatetic school. And remember Theophrastus, that may have been an easier transaction because it may be that as a, as a matter of property ownership, that what the property, any property associated with the peripatetic school uh, was technically owned by Theophrastus uh, uh, because Aristotle could, didn't have property rights, uh, not being an Athenian system. Um, now, a lot of the story of the travels of Aristotle's library comes from Strabo, who was, of course, um, as you all know, uh, born a couple hundred years after Aristotle lived. Uh, but, but he included in his geography um, this story about what happened to Aristotle's writings, basically, because Aristotle's library was presumed to include these, these notes of his lectures. Um, and part of Strabo, you know, claim to author, to credibility in this regard uh, was that when he lived in Rome, starting in 44 uh, BCE, he studied with a man by the name of Tyrannian, who was the former tutor of Cicero, and with Xenarchus, both of whom were members of what was then by that time recognized as followers of the Aristotelian school of philosophy. So presumably these stories about Aristotle's library came through this, this line of, of people who were expressly the sort of the scholarly heirs of Aristotle's time at the Lyceum. So in any event, the first, first, the library was in the hands at first of Theophrastus. And Theophrastus uh, continued the Lyceum, and i.e. the peripatetic school of philosophy for 35 years after, after the death of uh, his colleague and uh, Aristotle. Uh, and then when Theophrastus passed away and presumably retained uh, stewardship of Aristotle's library, um, Theophrastus then bequeathed the library to someone by the name of Neleus. Um, and again, this is according to Strabo. Uh, and it's the story that has come down to us and everybody we kept recites in some version. Um, Neleus, for some reason, took it away from Athens to an area of Asia Minor called Skepsis. And I don't know, Greg, are you familiar with, with that area? I gather it was in the kingdom of Pergamon. 
no, no, no. Yeah, well, it's, it's there in, as I call it generically, Asia Minor. <laughs> um, so Neilius had it, and he in turn bequeathed this, what must have been, you know, uh, basically boxes of scrolls, uh, bequeathed it to his heirs, who, as Strabo describes them, were common people who kept the books under lock and key and didn't even care about them. Now, at some point, apparently, uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit further, the um, the rulers of the king of uh, kingdom of Pergamon decided they were going to build their own great library, Library of per Pergamon, kind of in the tradition of the Great Library of Alexandria. Uh, and they were going around trying to buy up as many famous works as they could to have as the starter set of their new library. Um, and apparently, uh, if somebody wouldn't sell them, then they would basically be appropriated. So that is the, the reasoning behind why Neleus' heirs apparently buried, put in a cellar, put in a cave, various stories describe it differently, this, this library of Aristotle. Um, and uh, it stayed there for like 150 years. Now, there is an alternate story that indeed Neleus didn't keep all of Aristotle's library together and that he actually sold a substantial portion of it. Now, this is before it ever got down through his ears, higher, hiding it from the school of per the library of Pergon Pergamon founders, that he sold it, pieces of that library to the great library at Alexandria. Um, and so it's, as is generally thought, it's, it's possible both stories are, 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 are in part true. Um, and so what we have is that these original manuscripts, again, not originally written by Aristotle, but originally compiled somehow by his students and perhaps edited by him, uh, we're now partially in Skepsis and partially in Alexandria. And of course, Alex, the Library of Alexandria was, uh, you know, a huge endeavor of a huge repository of many ancient works. But certainly, again, since I said Aristotle was a superstar from the beginning, anybody starting a new library or a new collection, it would have been quite, quite the, uh, just like it would be nowadays, quite the feather in their cap if they could claim they had Aristotle's original library manuscripts. Um, in any event, Strabo continues that after the collection had been hidden by Neleus's lines of descendants for over 150 years, um, a book collector or seller, uh, you know, a bibliophile by the name of Apelicon bought whatever remained from Neleus's heirs and took the then dilapidated collection back to Athens, um, where the story goes that he tried to refurbish the manuscripts because now they were, after being hidden someplace there in Skeptis for several generations, Needless to say, there was deterioration, there was loss. He tried to compile them back and build it up into, again, the definitive library of Aristotle. And apparently, since he was not a, a member of the peripatetic school of philosophy, which had continued on all these generations under successive leaders, um, it was well known that, that what he put together if, if there even was such a thing, was kind of a botch. Um, nevertheless, when Sula, uh, and this kind of goes to that uh, issue about, um, as, as Strabo actually writes, he says, but much later when the books had been damaged by moisture and moth, their descendants sold them to a pelican of Tias for a large sum of money both the books of Aristotle and those of Theophrastus, 
Theophrastus had augmented what was known as uh, Aristotle's library immediately after Aristotle's death over that 35 ensuing years. But again, this is the quote from Strabo, but a Pelican was a bibliophile rather than a philosopher and therefore seeking a restoration of the parts that had been eaten through, he made new copies of the text, filling up the gaps incorrectly and published the books full of errors. However, when Sulla, uh, the Roman general, um, and you all know a lot more about Sulla than I do, and this now is according to the biographer of Plutarch, um, basically sacked Athens. Uh, one of the things that he heard about and decided he wanted to confiscate was this, this fabled library of Aristotle. And as Plutarch writes it, uh, putting out to sea with all his ships from Ephesus, on the third day, Sulla put into Piraeus, obviously right outside of Athens, and, and being initiated into the mysteries, which I don't even know what that means, maybe the mysteries of the peripatetic philosophy school, he took for himself... Elysian, Elysian, Elysian. Elysian, okay. Well... Um, the Elysian Mysteries, Sulla took for himself the library of the Pelican of Teos, in other words, it sounds like he confiscated it, in which were most of the books of Aristotle and of Theophrastus, then not yet, then, then not yet well known to the, to the many. And Sulla basically took it back to Rome. Um, now, the state of play is at this point we are talking about what, again, this fabled actual library of Aristotle. This is not to say that his works during this, two, this 300 year period of this little escapade uh, weren't being copied and there weren't copies of his work. So it's not as though this, this was the only extant version of his work. Copies were, had already been made. And since this, this library, this, this, this set of scrolls that were purportedly Aristotle's actual library um, had been in skep Skepsis and had may in part have been distributed to Alexandria, although it may be that they only had copies. Nevertheless, Aristotle's work was out in the world, separate and distinct from this actual group collection of manuscripts that were purportedly his, his original manuscripts, or at least the original manuscripts of the notes his students made and were considered to be the authorized notes of Aristotle's lecture. Um, and a question. Yes. Yeah. So when this library is traveling around and around and around, they, they copy the manuscripts, right? So when they left Athens, Athens still have copies of the manuscripts. I mean, they didn't, it's not that they didn't have anything from Aristotle, right? That's exactly right. They had copies of the whatever the content was. This is just the story of these notes, <laughs> whoever wrote them, whoever edited them, whatever, whatever they were, but the copies of those notes had been made and were circulating in the intellectual capitals of, of this area of the world, um, for sure. But again, copies that contain errors, um, trans we're starting to get into an era of translation. So of course, it's always valuable to have the source documents. Um, and that's why these, these travels of Aristotle's actual library is, is of interest. Um, and, and how did they make copies? Did they just like by hand or did they write on papyrus or I don't know what, what were they using at that time? And maybe I missed it, but. No, you didn't miss it. <laughs> And, but yeah, I think, and I'm not an expert in this area by far, even well versed in it. But I think basically, yes, you would have had people sitting down in desks, just as you did in medieval times, with an, an original and make, writing out a copy on scrolls 
which, you know, you basically go up and down and then roll some more paper and go some more. And then over time, and maybe by about this period of time, uh, the later Roman Empire, or the Roman Empire, um, you're starting to put in things called codexes that look more like what we think of as a book, you know, uh, rather than, than a scroll. But yeah, it would have been manually copied. Uh, it would have been in some cases, papyrus, but I think it was also done on linen. I could be wrong about that. And even I think paper may have been started to be be made. Various materials. Now, uh, what, what, yeah, uh, just yes, uh, a little comment on that. Yeah, I think almost all of the ancient Greek documents were written on papyrus. Um, parchment came in some centuries later. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't think I don't think any there was some early Egyptian writing on on linen, but I think all of these ancient Greek fragments are on papyrus. Right. That's right. I think you're right. I think you're absolutely right about that. And so, yeah, we but I do think they were scrolls, this this Aristotle's library. Um, and and they got as far as Rome. Um, just in the uh, you know first century uh, BC, um, where it is said it's in Rome, uh, Sulla basically turned the, this library over to somebody that by the name of Tyrannio the Grammar Grammarian, um, and that Tyrannio the Gr Grammarian then worked with Andronicus the Rhodian there in Rome. Um, and started to work on this material and to uh, put together uh, the first list of what could be considered the, it's called the Aristotelian corpus, the body of Aristotle's work. Now, again, we're now dealing with copies. We've seen that this, this, bib, this bookseller, Apollon, had, may have botched up the original manuscripts rather badly, and they had deteriorated anyway while they were Neleus. But by two fellows like this, Tyrannio and Andronicus, they could then make the comparisons with these copies that as Rika uh, mentioned, were, were extant throughout the, the civilized world and see of these remnants of Aristotle's library, uh, you know, it, it's kind of like we have the Bible and then we found the, um, the Dead Sea Scrolls. So we could kind of confirm by the Dead Sea Scrolls what modern scholarship had, had as the present body of, of the Bible. So anyway, these, Andronicus was also the 11th school arc, which I gather is the word for the head of the peripatetic school. So Aristotle's peripatetic school, the group that considered themselves basically this, this school of philosophy grounded in Aristotle's work, but also, sub, also supplemented by subsequent peripaticians, um, had continued on as a recognized group, and this Andronicus was uh, was the head of the uh, the Peripatetic school, um, and he compiled he compiled what was the first recognized complete list of Aristotle's writings, um, and he also uh, engaged in what was this other thing aside from translations, copies, moving around. This, this, this now tradition of commentaries on Aristotle's work. And commentaries are a huge thing. I mean, there have been massive amounts of commentaries on Aristotle's work. And of course, for some of, some of the information that may be missing, may have been found missing, here and there, pieces of Aristotle's work, uh, the commentaries can be a source of filling in the gaps because when commentators common, made their commentaries, they often would draw quotes from whatever source of Aristotle they were using. And it, may it turns out to be a quote that can be used to supplement a missing piece in the overall puzzle of what were what was the complete Aristotelian corpus, as it's called. So now I should say at this point, 
you know, Plutarch has said his piece. Uh, Strabo has, has commemorated his version of the story of Aristotle's library. But at this point forward, there is no reference to anybody having any, even a portion of Aristotle's original manuscript scroll library. It sort of just goes poof. There's, there is no more of it. Um, and so in point of fact, if there ever was an actual group of scrolls that comprised the original scrolls of Aristotle's ex esoteric works, i.e. His, his, his students' notes, um, that is just long gone into to thin air. Um, I would note, however, and I've, I've put a little box up here that this is my own wild speculation. We never know. We, some of these excavations, somewhere along the line, they may come up with something that somebody could claim was part of Aristotle's library. For example, in, in Italy, there's, there's a place called the Villa of the Papyri, which is located in um, Herculea, Herculaneum, Herculaneum, uh, which uh, was one of the cities covered over by the famous eruption of Vesuvius. They are excavating that now, and they have these magical, this particular villa was apparently one of the most, is renowned as one of the most beautiful villas from that era. It anywhere. Um, it, it may have been owned by a member of Caesar's family, and um, they found apparently a lot of regrettably charred papyri. It was, aside from being a personal villa, it was also a library of some sort. Now, this would have been AD 79 that they're unearthing. Um, and so they've now got these, these, these magical scientific ways of actually recovering information from burnt pieces of papyrus, which is astonishing. And, and who knows, some portion of the legendary Aristotle library may be found at the Villa of the Papyri. Again, that's my own wild speculation. Uh, another possible candidate is uh, uh, the archaeological digs at a place called, now I cannot pronounce this word, I have no idea, Oxyrhynchus, Rhynchus, um, it's a place in Egypt, um, it's since the late 19th century they've excavated and there again found, but here even more more massive amounts of papyri, which that's a picture of all the volumes of the papyri that have been printed. And they're still printing volumes of these papyri that they found. Who knows, that was south of the famous library of Alexandria, which may or may not have bought some of Alexander's original library. Um, and who knows, it may be they might find something that they go, hey, here's a piece of Alice Starlin's library that we heard so much about. Again, it's just wild speculation on my part. But there's no question that um, whatever Alice Aristotle's library was, uh, it, to, as far as we know, is no more. Um, but as Marika pointed out, not to worry, uh, there were many, many repositories of copies of Aristotle's work. Now, again, there were copies and nobody, everybody was copying different copies of various copies of this. So, you know, it was a lot of, a lot of variation, but um, it's the framework that people were working on because the actual source documents went up in thin air through that whole story that we just went through. I had mentioned that uh, Alexander was one of the first uh, her heralds of Aristotle, I, I, I surmise, um, I, I don't have an actual citation for this, that he, he traveled to all these places and learned things. He, uh, he would have talked about his famous mentor the famous Aristotle, you know, colleague of Plato in Athens, etc. So he was one of the first, yeah. 
I, I just wanted to add that when uh, Alexander went uh, 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 into uh, to conquer Persia, he took uh, uh, a whole uh, slew of uh, philosophers with him uh, who actually promoted the education. Uh, one of them uh, was uh, uh, also a philosopher nephew of uh, Aristotle. Uh, I forgot his name. Uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, towards the end of Alexander's life, uh, he killed him uh, on supposedly some uh, treason or whatever charges. Uh, and that really spoiled the relationship between Alexander and Aristotle at the end. Mm. Uh, but, uh, uh, but he had a number of philosophers uh, uh, writing uh, the Greek uh, uh, world knowledge uh, with him, whatever he went. Right, and obviously they would have talked up Aristotle. And uh, so the conversation I, about- I'm, I'm, I don't think so. I think he took philosophers and the whole point was discuss different philosophies. It wasn't that he was sold to Aristotle. I mean, I think he, he brought different philosophers, different schools, and the whole point was to discuss with different, also with the, with the people that he was conquering too. So it's not that he was spreading Aristotle, Aristotelian philosophy. He was um, very interested in philosophy in general, I think. I, I think that, I, and I agree, I, I, I that, you know. That's usually I, spread for the discussion. Yeah, I retract, you know, I don't mean that he just was like, look, I'm, you know, I'm in the Aristotle, I'm gonna spread Aristotle. And again, we don't know what works of Aristotle were available um, from Aristotle's play, time at, you know, 20 years of Plato's Academy. Most of what we think of as Aristotle's works today are thought to have emanated from his time after Alexandra, when he was at his own school, the Lyceum, and amidst his own colleagues and students, the Peripatetics. But nevertheless, I kind of, maybe this is wild speculation again, I can't imagine that, you know, Alexander didn't mention him <laughs> with, and you know, as he traveled and in conversation, as Mariska, as you say, with the local philosophers, etc. So it was just getting that name out there, Aristotle, um, and creating demand for Aristotle's works, knowing about Aristotle's works, for copies of Aristotle's works, etc. Um, which kind of gets to the issue of these, these libraries and, and what Zach mentioned at the very uh, issue, uh, uh, outset. Um, Aristotle reputedly, and again, you all know more about this than I do, but reputedly visited Ashurbanipal's library, which at that point was already an ancient library. It had been established in the 600s, the seventh century BC. Um, is, that, is that right? It would have been the other, at any rate, seventh century BC. Um, I don't know if what Aristotle saw, the library would, would have been located near the famous battle site of Galgamela, um, whether he just saw ruins of an Ashurbanipal library or he actually saw a library, but apparently he was, he was quite struck by the idea of having, you know, massive libraries of learning in these great city states that he wanted to propagate throughout the region of his campaigns. Um, uh, if I, by the way, can I, if I, if I may add, when they discovered, right, as you, you said here, 30,000 clay tablets, so they, they were written in, in the, uh, uh, and they were before Ashurbanipal. Ashurbanipal uh, 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 ruled in seventh century, but this library uh, maintained uh, the information coming from a few millennia prior to that. Uh, probably, uh, uh, you know, some uh, tablets were maybe uh, from uh, third millennium BC, uh, or most of it maybe from the second. Uh, so it's, uh, uh, I think it would have been in the uh, a city of Nineveh, uh, what we call right now, that's probably around that Zagamela, uh, yeah. Right, exactly. And um, 
interestingly, that picture there is not a re, you know, like a graphic re, 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 recreation of Ashapon's library. That is apparently an actual modern building that they started building under Saddam Hussein's reign. Um, to uh, to create another uh, reincarnation of the famous Ashurbanipal Library. Um, in any event, uh, Alexander was inspired. Uh, as we know, he was uh, his general uh, Ptolemy. This was an idea that he apparently talked up to his generals and stuff. When you set up, when I leave you to set up these city states. You know, you got to set up these massive libraries, which is not to say there hadn't been libraries before, but it's these massive city state libraries as sort of an, an ornament to a, um, a ruler's uh, a presence, so to speak, a ruler's profile. Um, of course, the great uh, library at Alexandria was created under uh, Ptolemy, either one or two. There's not quite a, a sure about that entirely. And as I mentioned, the Pergamon, the rulers of the Pergam, the kingdom of Pergamon, um, up in that same area where that fellow Neleus and his heirs hid Aristotle's um, manuscripts to keep them away from uh, the Pergamon librarians uh, appropriation. Uh, that was another major library. Now, all of these, like not Ashurbanipal's, but Alexandria, Pergamon, they would have had uh, presumably uh, copies, good copies of Aristotle's work, which they would have commissioned um, or bought. Um, you know, how many copies of Aristotle's work were made during those first 300 years after Aristotle's death or even immediately after, during Theophrastus's 35 years of running the Lyceum after Aristotle died. Um, how many copies were made? Were the, did people commission copies were made? I don't really know, but obviously those would have been the best copies to have because they would have been the first generation copies. But these were, these were huge centers, again, for Aristotle being out in the world. Now, at this time, again, it's not until, as I mentioned earlier, the Roman era Andronicus, it seems that perhaps Theophrastus had, but there was not an idea of here is the full set of what Aristotle wrote, and here's what we have. So we have, we have books X, Y, and Z. And so we know we don't have books A, B, C, D, E, F up to X, Y, Z. So maybe we'll, we'll make a point of trying to get that to fill out our whole set. That wasn't really how it worked. They had what they had and they didn't know what they didn't have necessarily. Nobody had, had until Andronicus had put out that, that definitive list of Aristotle's work, which now was a definitive list of the copies of Aristotle's work, because the actual source documents were poof, gone in, in the course of time. Uh, I just want to say a little, now an example of how, you know, this, this sort of disbursement of copies of Aristotle's work happened is is uh, there was a, a discovery just in uh, the 1980s, which kind of underscored that, that narrative of transmission of copies of Aristotle's work from these great library centers. This is an actual, a little, a, a better, uh, or at least a recreation of the Alexandria, the famous library at Alexandria. And as you can see, it was a centerpiece of what Ptolemy created as Alexandria archeologically. That second uh, circle is the, the library's holdings grew to such an extent, and again, we're talking about holdings of scrolls, shells and shells stuffed, stuffed with scrolls. Um, there was a, the library, uh, there was a second, like a, a what would you call it, a, a satellite library at Sarap, Sarap called Sarapkum, which was uh, named after a goddess of some sort. Um, so the library was a large, um, large endeavor. The, the legend is that the library was burned down by Caesar um, when Caesar had to burn his fleet 
Um, uh, and however, that apparently is an apocryphal story. Uh, the library was not burned down and continued in existence till the Arabs came along. And it was ultimately dismantled by the Arabs in, 600, in the 600s, 600, 600 AD kind of range, by which time it, yeah. I'm sorry, I may add. Well, yeah. during, during the Caesar, uh, uh, when he was occupied, the library burned accidentally, actually, the, the uh, Egyptian troops uh, started to send uh, missiles uh, with fire, fire missiles, and how it started to burn, but they put down the fire, so it was only partially damaged, but they, they considered that the library really needs to exist in, in its majority at the time of uh, Aurelian in 274 AD. You know, that's when it was uh, actually completely burned. I don't know, maybe some remnants remain to the... Uh, Apparently some remnants remained um, uh, because there are subsequent visitors who left their memoirs of their visits over the course of the ensuing centuries. But apparently it was badly deteriorated. You know, it's just like that Hulk, steaming hulk over there is what used to be the great library of Alexandria. Um, but yeah, it's... It, uh, and the point to this just being that the, the idea that Caesar burned it down and it disappeared at that instant is not quite the actual narrative on it. Um, so there were either some originals uh, of Aristotle's library at the Great Library at Alexander. There most certainly were copies and hopefully they were good copies. Now, interestingly, this is a group of manuscripts that have been recently discovered um, that, uh, let's see, when was it? I think it was like in the 1980s, uh, late 19th century, I'm sorry, not the 19th entries. Uh, those scrolls that I just showed, uh, four papyrus scrolls were discovered in Egypt uh, in, in an, a place called Hermopolis. Um, and what those scrolls are, it, it turns out that uh, when one of one of the areas that Aristotle was interested in was obviously uh, political organization, so to speak. And apparently, when he was creating that work, his work, the politics, he had some of his colleagues or students or whomever uh, went around and researched and recorded the constitution of 158 ancient Greek city states. Um, now, what this copy on these scrolls is that source material for Aristotle, what Aristotle used to write his politics, uh, his work, the politics. Um, and this, this partic these particular scrolls are copies of the Constitution of Athens. So you can you can see how uh, this was apparently in a pro excavated from a place that was may have been a private library. Um, they can tell that the scrolls were originally to re used to record farm accounts um, in 78-79 Common Era, um, and then later used to record a copy of this Aristotelian text. Um, and there were several different people involved in. in doing this copying um, and that that those they're presently in the uh, British Museum. But this is a material um, that's relatively recent um, and it just goes it's just an interesting example of the of the transmission of what it would have been the, the content of Aristotle's original library of work. Um, Okay, let's see, go this way, which brings me to now the era of catalogs, translators, commentators, and what came to be what I call the big split between the East and the West regarding Aristotle. So basically, to start off, this fellow Andronicus of Rhodes, who was in Rome and took supposedly partially had access to the material that's, that Sulla 
took from Athens, confiscated from Athens, together with a lot of copies, you know, probably good copies that the libraries in Rome already had, et cetera, um, put together what was known as the basic divisions, took all these, these separate works of Aristotle's that were floating around in various copies, et cetera, and divided them up into what are still the recognized kind of big general categories of Aristotle's work. And I'm not gonna go into any of the substance of Aristotle's work too much because I don't understand it that well, but nonetheless, there was the works known as logic, which is, is called the organon, or which apparently means tools, physics, which were his works, Aristotle's works on natural philosophy, you know, his scientific observation of various flora and fauna, his lore about medicinal practices, etc. There's metaphysics, ethics and politics, and rhetoric and poetics. Now, the only reason I bring this up is that because this is this division is a, a good explanation for what was the big split between the East and the West regarding Aristotle's work and knowledge of Aristotle's work. Because basically what happened is in the West, they tended to completely disregard everything other than the logic section of Aristotle's work, which included the categories, the work, you know, these six works on interpretation, the prior analytics, the posterior analytics, the topics, and the work on sophistical refutations. So in other words, the West focused on that work, that body of work, that's that part of Aristotle's overall corpus Aristotelicum. Um, and, and just for whatever reason, disregarded everything else. On the other hand, in the East, and particularly as evolved into um, the, the great um, uh, Muslim philosophers, the golden age of Islam philosophers, they looked at the entirety of Aristotle's body of work and built up a body of commentary on this work and a body of exegesis on this work. And as, you, as we'll see, ultimately, that's what they then brought in medieval times back to Europe was this fuller view of the entirety. So it wasn't that the West didn't know or forgot about Aristotle, they didn't, they, but they did forget about a large, or chose to disregard a large portion of Aristotle's body of work in order to develop this, the usefulness of his logic sections. Uh, one, one of the people that uh, is famous for being kind of pivotal as, as in terms of after Andronicus made an initial list in the third century AD, this fellow Diogenes Laertes, who was supposedly in either in Nicosia in Bithynia or Laertes in Sicilia. Uh, nevertheless, he compiled something called the lives and opinions of eminent philosophers. Um, and he, he made it his, his work to kind of gather together all those various stories that we saw those vitae of Aristotle, put together one coherent story of narrative of Aristotle's life. And he also made a, 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 a listing um, and he listed 156 titles divided into 400 books. So I guess you could have one title could be book one, book two, book three. And he estimated that the total body of the Corpus Aristotelium was 445,000 some odd lines of writing, which I thought about. And if you think that a typical printed page, I think has on average about 30 lines of writing, that is a lot of work <laughs> that was, was deemed to be Aristotle's 
corpus. Now, again, we don't have Aristotle's original work anymore in the original manuscripts. We do have, even at this point, third century AD, a zillion con commentaries from all over the world. Um, so this is always pairing back and trying to piece together more and more about, well, of that lost original, what is, what is Aristotle's actual, actual works or what we all, we, these scholars will have a consensus. And the Diogenes was considered kind of a linchpin in making this definitive listing of, of what the work was as gleaned from excerpts from these commentaries and copies and everything else that was out there. Um, another, and I'm, I'm needless to say, skipping over hundreds if not thousands of people that were involved in this Aristotle enterprise, basically all over the world, <laughs> at least the, you know, the, um, the Middle East, Greece, Italy, and at that point, Spain and portions of, of Europe. Another key figure in sort of the, 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 move, the, um, the move of Aristotle into the mainstream of Western European thought was Boethius, who was um, uh, located in Rome. Um, his claim to fame is he was one of the first ones to make a translate or one of the first widely recognized translations of Aristotle, which all of these copies and commentaries and compilations had basically been in Greek. He was one of the first to trans make translations of Aristotle into Latin, reliable translations, uh, translations that people recognized as, as credible. Um, and as you can see, what he translated was not, it was only those, those books in what is called the general, what was then looked at as the general character portion of Aristotle's work known as his logic works, the categories on interpretation, prior analytics, topics, sophistical representation. So obviously if that's what was available then in Latin, that's what got disseminated throughout um, Western Europe. Um, he also wrote his own work, which is very famous, which is called his Consolation of Philosophy, which, which you all may have heard of, heard of um, which is, is very often these famous Aristotelian players, shall we say, uh, are famous for their own work as well, which is sort of may or may not, it might be critical of Aristotle, it might be, um, it might be uh, something that it, you know draws upon Aristotle. Um, and by yeah. the way, on the previous page, can you mm -hmm. it's page that says he was born about a year after Otto Eiser deposed the last Roman emperor. It was a year 476. I don't know if he was born in 447. How could that be? Oh, so that must be wrong then. Yeah. Because the the other answer came to power in 476, that official end of the Western Roman Empire, symbolic end. Theodore the Great. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so that was in 493. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah, it was probably in 493. It was in that vicinity of time, but thank you. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so this, this split, this kind of comprised what I call the big East-West split in Aristotle, for lack of a better word, appreciation. This idea that the Westerners, it's not that they didn't know about Aristotle. Everybody knew about Aristotle. It's not that Aristotle's work, uh, in Greek especially, copies were out there. They were available everywhere. Um, commentaries were out there and available everywhere. It's just that in the East, for some reason, Aristotle became known for his work of logic, particularly the categories, the 10 categories. And everything else was kind of not either not known or not considered 
of merit, of value. Um, whereas in the East, the entirety of Aristotle's work was valued and, and developed in terms of commentary, um, et cetera. Uh, so in, in any event, as, as, as I mentioned, the organon, the part that the West picked up on was the categories on interpretation, prior analytics, posterior analytics, topics, and sophistical refutations. Um, and uh, I did come across this, one of these recent, you know, relative modern scholarly works. And um, this, this just underscores that notion that, uh, as this writer says, the drastic restriction of the parts of the corpus Arist aristotelicum selected for serious discussion is among the most noticeable differences between the Latin and the Greek reception of Aristotle. Um, and then he goes on to talk about there were phases of this, uh, the North African phase, uh, the Greco-Latin logic of Boethius that we've seen, and then the scholarly logic of the encyclopedists. Um, so, for example, he says, in particular, while authors such as Simplicius, and there's zillions of these commentators, who was based in Cilicia uh, in four to 500 common era, right, who, who was a Neoplatonist, uh, and Philoponus, another Neoplatonist in Alexandria, read and commented not only on the categories, but also on physics and on the soul, the literary production of the Latin world. So while the literary production of the Latin world focused exclusively on the organon, uh, augmented by this other work by Porphyry, another Neoplatonist. So this exclusive focus determined the nature of the Latin philosophical thought until the 12th century. Um, yeah. General question. So the, what, what was the role of the church? I mean, obviously the church chose what they was serving them, you know, what the, so what was bad or what was something that the church didn't want to use of his thought that they discarded? I mean, what, what was the main thing in general? Yeah, I think that that is an excellent question, and it's a huge topic. What was the role of the church in limiting uh, the recognition of Aristotle, the, of his full body of work? And there is no question that um, the church never, to my knowledge, this may not be entirely accurate, prohibited Aristotle and said, his works are, you know, not within what we consider acceptable. It's just that they, the church took the position that Eric, the only useful thing about Aristotle, and again, you know, there was a whole range of philosophers, you know, there's Plato and all these other people. Um, the usefulness of Aristotle was this, these tools, these sort of, almost rhetorical tools, these, these kind of analytical tools, like the 10 categories. But if you start, if, if you start getting into anything of Aristotle's that has to do with, um, you know, observations about the nature of the soul, the nature of God, um, the nature of God's creation, i.e. natural philosophy, well, that was probably considered off balance because it's like you don't need Aristotle. You've got everything you need from the Old Testament, the New Testament, and church doctrine. So, so you know, in the in the in among the church fathers, among the church clergy, among the church schools, they simply wouldn't have presented a full notion of Aristotle. They would have only presented this organon, this sub, this, this sole category of Aristotle's work. Does, does that make any sense to, in yes, terms of yes, yes. Yeah, in explaining what the church did? It's more, you know, it's more a sin of omission than commission. They didn't actively 
uh, prohibit him, they simply omitted to mention, oh, by the way, Aristotle did all this other, other work, had this full collection of other things he wrote about as well. And however, underlying that, that wasn't just neglectful omission, it was deliberate because they felt Aristotelian philosophy was not really of value that, you know, the church's philosophy was, um, you know, the Old Testament, the New Testament, and church doctrine, and that that, would, that should be sufficient when you're ruminating about things like the nature of the soul or the nature of God or the nature of God's creation. But, and, and, but yeah. uh, isn't it uh, Thomas Aquinas reconciled it later? Uh, yes, yes. And that's why I say at this point, we've got the East-West split, but we will see a little bit later the reconfluence. Um, uh, just to mention these patristic fathers or fathers of the church, um, they varied and it, it, this split kind of evolved slowly. So we see an early church father, Clement of Alexandria, um, in his works uh, makes considerable mention to Aristotle. Um, he talks about this basic split between esoteric and exoteric. Um, he provides one of the earliest references to Aristotle's metaphysics, which was not part of the organum. Um, he names, he frequently references Aristotle in his works, and actually Clement is a source for some fragments of some of Aristotle's lost works. However, like a couple generations later, well, like 200 years later, we have Augustine. Uh, same area around, you know, Hippo, Augustine of Hippo, but he, of course, spent a lot of time in Alexandria. And Augustine explicitly mentions in his confessions, he says, and what did it profit me that scarce 20 years old, a book of Aristotle, which they call the 10 predicaments, which would have been the 10 categories, falling into my hands, on whose very name I hung as on something great and divine, so often as my rhetoric master of Carthage and others accounted learned, mouthed it with cheeks bursting with pride. Uh, I read and understood it unaided. But, he goes on to say, what did all this further me, seeing it even hindered me? when imagining whatever was, was comprehended under those 10 predicaments, I essayed in such wise to understand, oh my God, thy wonderful and unchangeable unity. Uh, also, as if thou also had been subject to thy own greatness or beauty, so that as embodies, they should exist in thee as thy subject, whereas thou thyself art thy greatness and beauty, which, is a little, it would take some time to sit and think about what he's trying to say there, yeah, right? He but, something, I mean. Yeah, but in the bottom line, it's that basic thought. Look, Aristotle's great, perhaps, for these, you know, these rhetorical tools that he describes, like the 10 categories. However, when it comes to understanding God, the nature of God, they, they aren't, they're not helpful and they might even be inimical if they detract from church doctrine based on the Bible regarding the nature of God or the nature of the soul, or as I said, the nature of God's creation. So this little excerpt from Augustine is a, is a good little teaser about what this split was. And by the way, I think Augustine was reading it in Greek, although it might have been since uh, this was before the time of Boethian's Latin translations. But apparently Augustine either knew a little bit of Greek, uh, even though he wrote in Latin, um, uh, or in these people, as he talks about his rhetorical master, basically verbally described it. Um, to students. So that's, a, that's also a little insight about how, you know, Aristotle transmission was going on, because by the time of As Aristotle, we're, um, what, 350 plus three, we're almost 700 years, years out from Aristotle the man. So yeah, uh, it, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. Uh, Augustine most certainly knew Greek, uh, uh, because he was prior to become Christian, he was a Neoplatonist, 
uh, uh, studying uh, Plato and uh, Aristotle. Uh, uh, also, in the Roman society, um, uh, educated people uh, were known uh, to be educated because they knew Greek. It's, uh, it was one of the uh, uh, prerogatives of education. So uh, uh, I'm pretty certain he knew Greek. Yeah, yeah. Well, for whatever reason, he read it and he wasn't impressed. <laughs> and I think it's probably, uh, number one, again, interestingly, and in all these patristic fathers that I've, I've listed here, I think the majority in one way or another referenced Aristotle. Although, for example, when you have Irenaeus of Lyons, which is up there near the head of the list, he was, he only cited him to refute him or to diss him, as they'd say nowadays. But that's a way Aristotle, the name Aristotle was still out there. <laughs> but it's again, it's not that Aristotle was lost to the West. It's just the West took a different tact with regard to Aristotle's work and body of thought, um, which then gets us to the other side of the great split, which is the Eastern side. Um, and again, I'm going, basically, it seems like the, the long and short of the story is that Aristotle's works in Greek came to places, came to Persia uh, and, you know, the, the, the greater region of Persia um, via uh, Syriac writers. So it, it was, a, you know, a form of, it came in a form of Syriac Greek. And uh, there's, there's a whole list of these writers. They're well known. They were commentators. But the body of work of Aristotle, together with this growing body of interpretive commentary, made it into Islam. And during the Islamic golden age, which now, you know, we're up to, you know, a, a later period, um, uh, where they fully embraced the entire scope of Aristotle's work, including especially the work regarding natural philosophy. Um, and one of the big jumps was by this uh, Al-Kindi, who apparently was chosen by the caliph to head up something that's somewhat disputed as to whether it did or didn't exist, but something referred to in the, in the ancient literature as the House of Wisdom in Baghdad. Um, where his, the, the focus was to translate, uh, make a definitive translation of uh, the Aristotle's work as now, you know, inherited through the Syriac writers, probably Alexand from Alexandria as well, into Arabic. Um, and uh, once that occurred, and you had then wide dissemination in is throughout Islam, Islamic scholars during this golden age of Islamic scholarship. Uh, as I said, interestingly, in the East, we have the, these, these geniuses who are like polymaths um, and physicians and scientists and, and the rest of it, who were, built this great edifice of commentary in and interpretation on the works of Aristotle as of course now they were reading in Arabic. Um, and uh, so, you know, we have, there's Al-Razi, Al-Farabi, Avicenna. Um, Avicenna, I, I included that picture, that kind of odd picture of a, a bust of him, that's actually from a school of ophthalmology in, in Iran. Because um, <laughs> apparently Avicenna was a famous ophthalmologist. But uh, these men, you know, it was this huge era of uh, doing another, um, you know, uh, accumulation of received wisdom and building on that. Um, not only Aristotle, obviously, uh, but Indian texts, um, other, other 
other Greco-Roman philosophers, Neoplatonic, etc. But they they accomplished this this task of translating into Abyssin, uh, into Arabic, and then they had these great geniuses who built on, um, in some cases, refuting or disproving Aristotle's uh, natural philosophy works. But nevertheless, fully going through the entire corpus of Aristotelian, Aristotle's work, not just the logic work. Um, and that kind of brings us to, as you were alluding to, Greg, this, what I call the medieval reconfluence. Um, because at this point, this, this kind of split between how the East uh, approached Aristotle and how the West approached Aristotle came to a sort of, as I call it, reconfluence. I don't know if it was a reconciliation, which these writings of men like Al Razi, Al Farabi, Avicenna were brought to Spain, basically. You know, when you had the Islamic. Um, conquest of, of uh, the Spanish peninsula. So that entire body of work morphed to that, to Western Europe via Spain, and then was brought into contact with what had been Western, what was then Western uh, developing philosophy. And in Spain, uh, you had Averroes, who was born in Cordoba. He subsequently um, relocated and lived his life in North Africa. Uh, you also had not just the, uh, the Islamic schools, but also Maimonides, who was Jewish, obviously, who was born in, born in Cordoba, although he subsequently also uh, relocated to North Africa, specifically to Cairo. The, the work on Aristotle that, that they received from the great Arabic Islamic scholars, these scholars, as I showed, Arazi, Al-Farabi, al, al, al most notably, I'm sure, I'm sure they were the others. Their work was then translated from Arabic so it's now gone from Aristotle's Greek to Arabic translations to Arabic commentaries. And it wasn't so much that they brought to the West parts of Aristotle that Aristotle, that the West didn't already know about, even though they might have been ignoring in large part. What they brought was a demonstration of an exegesis of Aristotle's work, of building on Aristotle's work, on using Aristotle's work to formulate a philosophical approach to, to things such as notions of God, notions of the soul, etc. And their work, their commentary work, their exegesis work is what was accepted and embraced by Albus Mangus, uh, uh, Albert the Great, and Thomas Aquinas, and formed this, this confluence then back of the West, in essence, reappreciating the full range of Aristotle's work, not just the organon kind of rhetorical and logic tools. Um, some of this, as a practical matter, uh, what happened was that only 30 years after Averroes' death in 1198, um, there were already translations of Averroes from Arabic into Latin. Um, and these became available in what were then the newly developing universities. Um, and as a matter of fact, it, it appears, I picked up from somewhere from Googling around, that in 1255, the statutes of the Parisian art faculty uh, at the University of Paris 
declared that all known works of Aristotle be mandatory reading for students. In other words, now it wasn't just like, oh, you want to know about Aristotle? Here's the categories. That's it. It was like, no, it's going, it, we now know, and we're lucky because uh, we don't have to recreate the wheel. We're, we're suddenly the, you know, the recipients of this wisdom of the golden age of uh, Islam, in this case, as transmitted via Averroes, who had actually been born in Cordoba, and, and in, in Spain. Um, and then what happened was people like Thomas Aquinas and Albert the Great encountered this work now available in Latin translations, these commentaries by Averroes in places in intellectual nexes like the University of Paris. Um, and so, you know, uh, there actually, interestingly, there had been some work, the Latin translations of Ares, Ar Averroes and, and some of the other Arab philosophers that we've just looked at was um, done in Sicily, which makes sense because as we know, Sicily was this interesting crossroads of several cultures, um, Western European culture, Arabic culture, etc. And there was a fellow there by the name of Michael Scott, and he, and I guess it was Michael the Scott, he must have been an interesting fellow. Now this is, um, uh, you know, right around the time of Averroes, it's prior to uh, a generation or so about prior to at Tom, the Thomas Aquinas' generation, but he was born in Scotland. He then lived in Paris, Bologna, Palermo, Toledo. He learned Arabic and took it upon himself to, to translate Avicenna and Averroes, which would have been no mean feat. So good for the Scots, <laughs> but it's going to show that we suddenly, you know, now we have this, this now sort of vibrant interactions going on that had been split there for a while. Um, uh, with regard to uh, Maimonides, uh, he was, of course, another, he, he one of his famous work, uh, now he was in Spain at the same time as Averroes, uh, something called the Guide for the Perplexed. And the interesting thing about this work is he attempted to reconcile, one of the first attempts, at least famous attempts, to reconcile pagan philosophy with um, theologically based uh, doctrine. In his case, uh, a Jewish uh, Jewish theology, so to speak. But this idea of, of recognizing the, the importance of work of, for example, Aristotle, that it was, it was human accomplishment that, that was worthy of reconciling with more revealed uh, theology um, is a precursor to what Thomas Aquinas attempted to do as between Aristotle and Catholicism. Um, and, uh, you know, Arist uh, there's no question that Thomas uh, was aware of both Averroes and Maimonides' work. Um, and, uh, you know, it was a precursor and an inspiration. Uh, in that regard. And again, specifically with regard to in Maimonides' case, uh, Aristotle, although Averroes was a range of things of which Aristotle was uh, included. Um, I also wanted to mention that uh, Albers, uh, who was uh, Thomas Aquinas's mentor, um, was one of the first uh, Westerners, Latinists, I guess you would say, to comment on virtually all of the writings of Aristotle. So again, all of a sudden now we're getting Latin, con you know, uh, Western European, shall we say, commentary on not just the logic, but on metaphysics, on the Nicomachean ethics, 
on a, you know, the full range of Aristotelian work. Um, so, you know, that's what we had. That was the nature of the rediscovery of Aristotle. It was not rediscovery that there were these Arist this Aristotelian body of work. It's a enlargement of bringing Aristotle in the mainstream of Western European thought, um, as opposed to just selecting out certain of his works. Um, let's see, let's see if there's anything interesting. Uh, he, he, of course, eventually ended up at the University of Paris, and that's where he crossed paths with Thomas Aquinas, and Thomas Aquinas, of course, enthusiastically adopted Albertus's approach uh, to this broader appreciation of Aristotle, and it forms, you know, a core thread in Thomas's Summa, Summa Theologica. Um, this I just included, it's a, you know, a modern scholar, uh, but it's, it's an interesting example. Um, uh, you know, there was a Latin, uh, like Averroes, Maimonides had been translated by two translators in Provence, actually, Jewish rabbinical translators. Maimonides had been translated into Latin, so Thomas and Aquinas would have had Latin versions available um, at the University of Paris. Um, and, it, you know, they would, the type of work that you, the type of intellectual work that they were doing was, um, for example, this scholar mentions, does this entire paper about uh, how Thomas, how Thomas builds upon Avicenna and Maimonides in his own commentary on the um, sentences. So it's not just that, you know, he would have made reference to, oh yes, Maimonides said this, or Averroes said this, both of them with regard to what Aristotle said about this topic, um, which in this case uh, had to do with um, uh, the possibility of the knowledge of God, but that it was actually, you know, a whole new synthesis of approach. Um, uh, and, you know, it's colossal kind of intellectually when you think about it. I mean, not just, uh, Thomas, but also Maimonides and Averroes and this, this confluence that happened, which now I kind of jump to the Renaissance Aristotle. And you may recall that I said at the very beginning, I was always kind of off put by this, this narrative that the, you know, um, the Renaissance folks in Florence rediscovered Aristotle that had been entirely lost during the dark ages. Um, you know, it, it just wasn't like that. It was a lot more complicated and a lot more nuanced. The, what was noticeable, what is notable about the Renaissance Aristotle is, um, and I'm just re-bringing up Raphael's picture, you know, here's Raphael doing this, this painting right in the Vatican and, and all of these, all of these ancient um, philosophers of the Athenian school are now fully recognized by the Catholic Church uh, as, as you know, important, uh, important thinkers in regard to human, human appreciation of, of things like God and the soul, etc. Um, but what apparently flourished in the, in in the Renaissance was commentaries. And this is one, this is a, an excerpt from the Stanford, the ever trusty Stanford, online Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Um, one scholar, Richard Bloom, has counted that there were 6,653 such commentaries for the period 1500 to 1650. Um, and he compares that to for the, fifth, the prior 15th century, the 1400s, there were only the entire century, there was only 750 commentaries uh, regarding Aristotle's work. So, you know, we had this explosion in the Renaissance of the number of these commentaries. Um, and uh, the, the, uh, the article goes on to say that um, 
uh, some of the reasons for this were the rising number of universities, uh, the advent of printing, which would have been huge, and advances in new trends in Aristotelian scholarship, still deriving from that, that reception of uh, now the Greek Aristotelian commentaries that came by way of Constant, scholars who came to Florence and Italy from Constantinople. But again, this was not a matter of they brought Aristotle. <laughs> what they brought were new bodies of thought and commentary and exegesis of the full range of Aristotle's work. And then in the, I think what, you know, possibly one can say is that with the advent of now all these universities and this, this rising broad spectrum of educated, educated people in quotes, together with the advent of printing, you now had um, Aristotle out in the mainstream of civic discourse and everybody and his brother were writing commentaries on Aristotle. So it had the appearance of this exfoliation of Aristotle uh, uh, appreciation, but it was not the discovery of Aristotle by a far cry, which is the common narrative. I just wanted to note in Raphael's painting, uh, he includes Averroes, who is looking over there the shoulder of Pythagoras and um, in the brown robe kind of crouched down is uh, Boethius. So it's interesting in that school of Athens, um, somebody advised Raphael, uh, you know, uh, in a fairly nuanced way, what the, um, the, the stream of development had been of Aristotelian thinking um, uh, over the course of the now millennia. Um, which brings us, I'm now going to make a huge jump from the Renaissance right into 19th century uh, uh, Prussia, which is what I call the German Arist uh, Aristotle. And uh, this fellow, you've probably heard the, the word, the phrase, the Becker numbering of our current kind of authorized comp compilations of Aristotle's work. And that, that was the work of this fellow who looks deniably rather dour, uh, August Emanuel Becker. And basically, um, he worked at the University of um, Berlin. And well, he was, he, uh, was at a couple of German or Germanic universities, Germany, I'm not sure it was fully put together at that point. Um, but, um, he made it his life work to put together a definitive edition of Aristotle's work, which now there were all sorts of, you know, editions, there were fragments, there were pieces from commentaries. He just took, took it all into his head and coughed out a definitive edition of Aristotle's work. And uh, this is it. This is somebody had this for sale on on the uh, the the internet. Um, and Becker numbering, which is still used, um, basically refers to the page number in the Becker definitive edition and the line within the page. Um, so when somebody writes an article, i.e., a commentary on Aristotle, this is how the references when it says, you know, Aristotle's poetic, Becker, da da da, da uh, it's referring to this, this definitive Prussian compil compilation. So this is what we're looking at is for us, Aristotle's library, <laughs> at least the portion that had to do with Aristotle's writing. I mean, Aristotle's library probably continued conti conti contains some other material as well. But this is, this is what in the West, at least, we consider the definitive edition. Um, and this is, this is a picture of the page of it. Um, and this is a little description about how that page, the Becker numbering goes. Uh, and um, so, it, as I said, it has to do with, you, you, when you're citing 
a something, some line, some paragraph from Aristotle, then you cite the Becker page number, whether it was column A or B, and then the line numbers within that column, at least if you're an Aristotle scholar. Um, now that brings us to what I call modern Aristotle. The Becker edition is, of course, as you can see, in Greek. So uh, what emerged quite expectably is that uh, the folks at Oxford um, said, you know, we have to have a definitive English edition. Edition of Aristotle's work in English. And they proceeded to commence the task of um, translating Becker's Greek definitive version into a definitive version in English. And that was first done in 1928-ish. This is, this is some, some excerpt I picked up from somewhere on the, on the internet about a notation at, you know, in 1928, basically saying, here's a notice of uh, one more volume brings near the completion of the Oxford translation of Aristotle. Um, here, and then they say what they contain, which just so happens to be the categories and the, the, the organon, basically, from the text of Becker. Um, and so this, this was worked on for like 10 years, this Oxford version of what Becker had worked on for like a lifetime of a, a definitive uh, Aristotle com compilation. Uh, that, of course, has been updated. Uh, this fellow, Jonathan Barnes, has, um, there was, because since even the 1928, there have been fragments of Aristotle uh, that, that were commentaries have come to light, which cite fragments of Aristotle, which have caused there to be an agreed upon consensus that doesn't such piece of Becker's work should be updated to reflect rather what we've, this new discovery we've made. And this fellow Jonathan Barnes in the 1980s was in charge of that. I can't imagine being in charge of a project like this. Um, but in any event, so this is the, the, the most recent complete works of Aristotle, at least in English. Uh, although now Princeton has uh, promulgated a digital edition of the complete works of Aristotle based on, uh, based on the Oxford translation, basically, but it's digitized. We don't even need paper anymore. Oh, if only Aristotle had had the internet. <laughs> he never would have had to worry about where his library went. Um, which brings me to the end of what I had to share it with you all tonight. And uh, I hope it was interesting. Um, Thank you. It was great. Thank you. Uh, I, I have a question, if I could. I think wonderful presentation. Uh, Thank you. Very good, interesting stuff. That's a lot of work. I had understood, apparently a bit mistakenly, that the fall of Constantinople in 1453 and the flight of Greek scholars from there to the West had been a major source of Greek works in general, and I, I had supposed Aristotle in particular, to the West. Mm -hmm. you, you didn't, uh, did you run across, was that a significant factor as far as you know? Well, as I mentioned, during the Renaissance, yes, there was, and I didn't put it on a slide, I just mentioned it verbally, there was this, this input of material from Constantinople and from, you know, been ferreted away in monasteries, etc. However, my, I think the point is that none of that was new Aristotle source material. What it was, was new commentaries on Aristotle, new insights on Aristotle. And in some cases, you know, it may have, again, you know, uh, brought some additional fragments or things of that nature. I think that also uh, more of the new material uh, uh, was regarding Plato, more so than Aristotle. Uh, uh, 
you know, because by that time, by the time of the Renaissance, by the time you had, you know, the folks coming from Constantinople to be under the patronage of Cosimo de Medici, et cetera, de Medici, um, we're talking uh, 200 years after you had Thomas the Great and, um, uh, I'm not Thomas the Great, Albert the Great and Thomas Aquinas intersecting with the work of Averroes and um, Maimonides. And anything at that point, probably anything that was coming from the golden age of Islam was pretty complete. Um, and, and you know, there wouldn't have been, as I said, a lot of new Aristotle coming from Constantinople, but there would have been more of these erudite commentaries and maybe commentaries on portions of Aristotle that because of the West's focus on just the organon, you know, the logic portions of Aristotle had not really been explored. So it's sort of like, oh yeah, we knew about that, but oh, now that we read your commentary, we see how that's actually more significant than we thought to begin with. But yeah, I, I think, uh, make a, you know, a short answer long, sorry. I think that actually the new stuff was more with regard to Plato than Aristotle. Um, one other question. Of the, the complete works of Aristotle that we now have, is any of that translated from the Arabic or is all of that from Greek originals? I mean, Greek copies of copies of copies. copies. But it's, is any of it retranslated from Arabic or are there Greek sources for all of it? I don't know the answer to that. I can guess in this regard, as, as I mentioned, Averroes, uh, who wrote in Arabic, and um, Maimonides, who wrote Arabic in Hebrew script. It's called Judeo-Hebrew. <laughs> um, they were both translated almost immediately upon, during their lifetimes, almost or shortly after their deaths, uh, into Latin. Um, and then, uh, particularly, you know, their commentaries. Now, remember, they were they were commentaries. Uh, now, as to what was retained in Persia, the Persian sources at, at you know places like that House of Wisdom, um, the I would think that, for example, if you're Becker putting together your definitive Prussian Greek version. The only usefulness of the Arabic material would have been primarily if it filled in some gap. They had some fragment that that managed to, um, you know, survive over the eons and translated into Arabic that had been lost on the sort of Greek side of Greek manuscript side of the house. And I don't know if there were such instances, but I, and again, this is like the Bible, it's always confusing. There may have been fragments where, oh yeah, we have these old Greek things, but what the Arab, Arabic translation is referring to appears to be referring to an earlier, more authentic Greek fragment than the Greek fragment we have in Greek. So it's all kind of mind boggling. I can, at one point in my slides, I, I actually included a slide, a picture of a slide rule. <laughs> you all, some of you all remember what a slide rule looked like. It looked like a ruler that had a middle portion that slid back and forth to make various calculations and kind of. He's showing figures, one. <laughs> yeah, 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 there you go. There you go, slide it out, there you go. You still have it. I think when, when you're Becker making this, you know, grand collection, the grand compilation of the definitive edition of Aristotle's surviving works, you're doing this slide for every new input, you're doing this slide rule thing. It might be that the piece you already have is more recent in time, um, whereas another piece comes along no, it is older in time. Another piece comes along that's more recent because let's say it's in Arabic. Um, but nevertheless, it turns out that that new Arabic was based on an older Greek piece than the Greek piece you have already. So you're, you know, you're sliding back and forth temporally, source-wise, et cetera. I mean, it's just mind-boggling to think about. 
fall. And it's, a, it's amazing we have anything, but that's what Aristotle, <laughs> take it for what, you, what it's worth. It's been through a lot in t- almost 2,500 years. And like I said, the amazing thing is, I mean, somewhere in all of that mix, Aristotle, very relatively early on in the 700s, was introduced into China. Um, Aristotle was well known from the get-go in India. As a matter of fact, the, it, the Indian philosophers take the approach that they actually, Aristotle was only a copy of their thought. <laughs> Aristotle was just a commentary on Indian philosophy, basically. Um, but I mean, and like I said, he was pretty much a superstar in his own lifetime. It's, it's extraordinary, an extraordinary human life. Uh, if I could follow up a bit. Um, of the complete texts we have, presumably there are a fair number of texts that are referred to from antiquity that we don't exist. So there's a lot of Aristotle's writings, whether esoteric or exoteric, that we know existed but have now disappeared. How does the vo- how much how much of that is there uh, relative to what we have in the complete works? Uh I don't, and again, I'm just, I'm going to punt off the, you know, uh, on this one since I'm not a scholar. I don't think, I think it's kind of self-defining, but I, I don't think there's a lot that we don't have. The bigger problem has been that a lot that was included, you know, like by Diogenes late, Laertes has subsequently been, however they manage that, determined to be spurious or Aristotle followers, not Aristotle, Aristotle. Um, and I think, I think that, uh, so yeah, I think we have more than we think we don't have, significant, a lot more. And that actually the issue is more of what we, thought we had, some of it actually isn't um, what is considered Corpus Aristotle. But of course, what was Corpus Aristotle if it was notes by students? Mm-hmm. Who the hell knows? So, um, I just want to thank you. I have one question. Uh, what was the benefit of those students walking around and learning? What, what, was it, what was that technique? Was it useful? Was it efficient? Was it ever tried, uh, walking around and learning in his gardens? That that's what Aristotle did. But Socrates used to do that. Yeah, so Socrates started. Yeah, I guess uh, it, it it probably um, promotes more in the way of discussion because uh, you know how you talk with people when you're walking with them. Uh, it's I don't know what about walking and talking. I think the Dutch have a saying for this. <laughs> they can't think if they're not walking. Um, there's something about walking and talking that uh, is conducive to um, interesting conversation as opposed to people sitting around like in that Lyceum building and Aristotle um, you know, pontificating. Although in fact, that was the curriculum. As I said, they're apparently scholarship is, has determined that there was a morning kind of curriculum series of lectures and an afternoon. And there were, there were kind of two different sets, different, different kinds of students attended one or the other of those, or perhaps in some cases, both. Um, but then there would have been these, these walk arounds because this, lyce- this lyceum was located in that garden. And that garden also already included, um, as one of the excerpts mentioned, a gymnasium, which I assume is a place you know, that, that uh, attracted arist- aristocratic, aristocratic young men. So you kind of had, you know, a lot going on in this civic, this little private civic space. But yeah, I don't know why walking and talking uh, <laughs> helps people to have conversations. Exercise was very important yeah. for the Greeks, so. <laughs> think about it. They didn't have blackboards back then. They didn't have PowerPoint. You didn't have a way, you didn't really have a convenient <laughs> way to do a display. So you must, you might as well just walk around, un- unless you're teaching math, which I don't think Aristotle did. 
Yeah, you know, so Socrates didn't have his school, uh, so he had no permanent place to talk about his philosophy. So that's why he walked in the market, and he also liked to engage uh, regular people, not just philosophers. Uh, you know, asking them questions. Well, with regards to Plato and Aristotle, they did have <laughs> their own school. <laughs> you know, they they must have <laughs> thought uh, well, I understand. differently. I I understand ancient Greek latrines were public were a public space. You all sat there together, and someone could get up there and do a presentation yeah, but, or talk about something or do a uh, do an act or something. Uh, yeah, yeah. The sophists so also do there was, public space. Yeah. There, yeah, there was a real danger of sitting on the for a nice poop and finding you've got Socrates sitting next to you. Well, the other thing, too, is I guess they would have been noticeable groupings. If there was this kind of park-like, it's almost like a theme park, you know, you had the gymnasium, you had the lyceum, you had these beautiful gardens, and then, you know, oh, hey, look at that, there's Aristotle with his gang coming down the, you know, the path. Um, so, you know, yeah, those peripatetics, they're always walking around, discovering, you know, it's like a doctor in a hospital with their train of interns behind them, you know, comes rolling down the hall. I suspect it was, it was a phenomenon. So maybe they just got labeled, they're the peripatetics, um, it, you know, whatever the Greek version of peripatetic, the peripatetic word is. One thing you, um, I meant, I, I deliberately look for too. I was like, somewhere in this story, there must be a woman. <laughs> Just give me one woman, Scott, in ancient times. Of course, there's zillions of modern, you know, modern uh, uh, women scholars involved in Aristotelian studies. But somewhere in that whole story of, you know, Theophrastus and Neleus and uh, Andronicus and Boethius and Thomas Aquinas and, you know, um, Averroes and Menomonides, just some woman, you know, involved. Nothing. I think Aristotle said that the women were. Um, um, what was like a man, a defected man or something like that. So for his point of view, women were very sub subhuman. So. Well, yeah, there's no question Aristotle didn't have much of a, uh, you know, uh, yeah. wasn't wasn't a, 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 you know, equal rights kind of person with regard to gender equality. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think I hope that somewhere in the story, you know, kind of like you have a story of um, Abelard and Heloise, you know, something, yeah. just some woman in there. And, and Greg, you're right. You yeah, mentioned right. Sappho. So, but also Hypatia. But, but, Hypatia. but did they, did, did they, you, you, did list, you did list Cyril of Alexandria, who probably the guy that had, who had, he's probably the guy responsible for getting Hypatia of Alexandria murdered. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, that now I don't know if Sappho or Hypatia actually dealt with Arist you know, this entire body of Aristotle commentary or. Well, well Sappho lived uh, way before Aristotle. Yeah. Lived yeah. In yeah. The century well, so I, I thought, but I thought Hypatia Hypatia was, must have. Yeah. Hypatia was a mathematician, wasn't she? Like yeah, Sappho was a poet. Well, but Sappho also had a school of, of philosophy for women in, in oh. Mytilene, by the way. Yeah, which is interesting. There may have been a, I, that's a that would be a good add-in there then. That would be one way to at least get a woman in the story. I wish I, 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 I would, if I ever do that slide deck again, I'll try to add that, well, add thought, that in. I've yeah. got Elsprag de Camp's book on ancient engineers here. It's a really fascinating read on old technology. And he's claiming that Aristotle got almost all of the science wrong. And he claims that men have more teeth than women. And he figures Aristotle was married twice. All he had to do was ask his wife to open her mouth and count. Obviously, he got his uh, heliocentric system wrong. Uh, you know, we yeah. know that. <laughs> so, I mean, they, they, they were wrong about a lot of things. They were at the very beginning of uh, uh, knowledge, uh, they, they just uh, uh, questioned and uh, wanted to learn. Uh, nobody else uh, really made that effort. Well, how did it work? Else, maybe I just while. also wanted to say that they did not differentiate between different parts, philosophy or math, mathematics or uh, physics uh, or cosmology. It was all the same, it was all philosophy. 
Yeah, the natural the philosophy. philosophy. Yeah, the, yeah there was natural philosophy. Yeah, up until 19th century, it was called natural philosophy. If, if you read if you read Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, she's talking about natural philosophy. Sure. I'm actually wondering, because the other comment was made, again, by L. Sprague de Camp, and maybe you want to react to this. Um, he was arguing what basically happened in the 16th and 17th centuries is that people took Aristotle as, bi as biblical, and what scientists had to do was go and perform experiments and find out that Aristotle was wrong frequently. Well, that's an interesting point. It's almost like the pendulum swinging to the opposite extreme, where you know, you know, where all of a sudden they're taking Aristotle as, as you say, as Bible in a way, um, as opposed to now the 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 great um, Islamic scientists had already been, you know, disassembling Aristotle's kind of scientific assertions. Um, uh, with regard to natural phenomenon. Um, but yeah, I think there was uh, in Western Europe then this, this uh, what shall I say, natural, natural philosophy is the best way where, where, oh, there's a philosophy, not a science of nature. There was sort of a distinction there. And I can see how, you know, the re, this, this, full appreciation of the entire range of Aristotle, then Arist the Western Europeans would have jumped on Aristotle's natural philosophy assertions um, two, 300 years later than the Islamist scientists had, and then had to go through their own process of becoming disenchanted um, from the enchanted Aristotelian uh, work. You, you know, I just mentioned, uh, I, I think I said heliocentric. No, it, it was geocentric uh, uh, idea of, about how the world organized, I mean, the cosmos uh, organized. Uh, not only that it was wrong, but it actually uh, uh, held the, the science for like a few hundreds of years. I mean, yeah. that's uh, why they were burned because the church accepted uh, this Ptolemaic system uh, that was developed from Aristotle. Uh, of geocentric and uh, when uh, Giordano Bruno and uh, uh, you know when they were all saying that it's a heliocentric that that's uh, that really created uh, a big problem so in a way you could say uh, that he played a negative role uh, uh, later on but th maybe we should uh, concentrate on what he got right I mean and, and there were still plenty of things uh, uh, you know he got right and the influences uh, uh, that's not, I mean, I saw an article, I think that guy's name's Morgan, he was measuring skulls back in the 1840s. And I've got to read back up on that. And basically, he was horribly wrong, but nobody knew, nobody knew any better at the time. He did the science, he generated the numbers, and we can go through the numbers and see why it's, it wasn't it wasn't good research. Um, so like, you know, you've got to look at something and come up with theory and test the theory. And then if you're, even if you're proven wrong, you've got a better understanding of what you're doing. So, I mean, Aristotle did do a lot of practical, did do a lot. My understanding is that Aristotle did do a lot of practical science back in the day. Yeah. Well, but he did a lot of observation too. Like we talked about Matilde on, you know, local species and, and, and descriptions of local flora and fauna and, um, so he did a lot of kind of observational records, recording of his observations, which are just that. And like I said, there's such that certain species can still be, you know, identified as, you know, uh, native to these particular regions uh, around the Aegean. Could I say something? I actually don't know so much about Aristotle. But I um, learned, for example, very long ago, one of his theories was theory of spontaneous emergence. Did anyone, anybody heard about it? It's like, for example, uh, if uh, light, um, if uh, uh, like um, sunlight goes somewhere, there could be a mouse appears from just nowhere. It's spontaneous emergence. 
Life I, is spontaneously emergent. It's I, not I've heard of that. somewhere. And this theory was, was uh, uh, like uh, natural philosophers and scientists fought this theory through something like 16th century. You mm -hmm. couldn't disprove it. Until they had microscopes. Yes, something like this. You see, so so it was really serious um, obstacle of uh, yes yes obstacle on the way of development of actually scientific research, and uh, and it was it, for me it was very <laughs> somehow somehow obvious he could talk to any peasant and they would explain to him without mouse uh, female mouse meeting male mouse there won't be any other mice you see so it's kind of from my point of view it's obvious but that was uh, mm. He probably, what you're saying, that he uh, uh, described a lot of natural phenomena, but probably he uh, 